Section one of Essays in Idleness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chufi Galeazzi. Essays in Idleness by Agnes Replier. Agrippina, Part One. She is sitting now on my desk, and I glance at her with deference, mutely begging permission to begin but her back is turned to me and expresses in every curve such fine and delicate disdain that i falter and lose courage at the very threshold of my task i have long known that cats are the most contemptuous of creatures and that agrippina is the most contemptuous of cats the spirit of buhaki the proud theban beast that sat erect with gold earrings in his ears at the feet of his master king hana the spirit of moeza whose slumbers mohammed himself was not bold enough to disturb the spirit of micetto chateaubriand's ecclesiastical pet dignified as a cardinal and conscious ever that he was the gift of a sovereign pontiff the spirits of all arrogant cats that have played scornful parts in the world's great comedy look out from agrippina's yellow eyes and hold me in subjection i should like to explain to her if i dared that my desk is small littered with many papers and sadly overcrowded with the useful inutilities which affectionate friends delight in giving me at christmas time st beuve's cat i am aware sat on his desk and roamed at will among those precious manuscripts which no intrusive hand was ever permitted to touch but saint beuve probably had sufficient space reserved for his own comfort and convenience i have not and agrippina's beautifully ringed tail flapping across my copy distracts my attention and imperils the neatness of my penmanship even when she is disposed to be affable turns the light of her countenance upon me watches with attentive curiosity every stroke i make and softly with curved paw pats my pen as it travels over the paper even in these halcyon moments though my self-love is flattered by her condescension i am aware that i should work better and more rapidly if i denied myself this charming companionship but in truth it is impossible for a lover of cats to banish these alert gentle and discriminating little friends who give us just enough of their regard and complaisance to make us hunger for more m fay the naturalist who has written so admirably about animals and who understands as only a frenchman can understand the delicate and subtle organization of a cat frankly admits that the keynote of its character is independence it dwells under our roof sleeps by our fire endures our blandishments and apparently enjoys our society without for one moment forfeiting its sense of absolute freedom without acknowledging any servile relation to the human creature who shelters it the cat says m fay will never part with its liberty it will neither be our servant like the horse nor our friend like the dog it consents to live as our guest it accepts the home we offer and the food we give it even goes so far as to solicit our caresses but capriciously and when it suits its humour to receive them rude and masterful souls resent this fine self-sufficiency in a domestic animal and require that it should have no will but theirs no pleasure that does not emanate from them they are for ever prating of the love and fidelity of the dog of the beast that obeys their slightest word crouches contentedly for hours at their feet is exuberantly grateful for the smallest attention and so affectionate that its demonstrations require to be curbed rather than encouraged all this homage is pleasing to their vanity yet there are people less magisterial perhaps or less exacting who believe that true friendship even with an animal may be built upon mutual esteem and independence that to demand gratitude is to be unworthy of it and that obedience is not essential to agreeable and healthy intercourse a man who owns a dog is in every sense of the word its master the term expresses accurately their mutual relations but it is ridiculous when applied to the limited possession of a cat 
I am certainly not Agrippina's mistress, and the assumption of authority on my part would be a mere empty dignity, like those swelling titles which afford such innocent delight to the Freemasons of our severe republic. If I call Agrippina, she does not come. If I tell her to go away, she remains where she is. If I try to persuade her to show off her one or two little accomplishments, she refuses, with courteous but unswerving decision. She has frolicsome moods in which a thimble, a shoe buttoner, a scrap of paper, or a piece of string will drive her wild with delight. She has moods of inflexible gravity in which she stares solemnly at her favorite ball rolling over the carpet without stirring one lazy limb to reach it. Have I seen this foolish toy before? She seems to be asking herself with musing austerity. And can it be possible that there are cats who run after such frivolous trifles? Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity, save only to lie upon the hearthrug and be warm and think grave thoughts to feed a serious soul. In such moments of rejection and humiliation, I comfort myself by recalling the words of one too wise for arrogance. When I play with my cat, says Montaigne, how do I know whether she does not make a jest of me? We entertain each other with mutual antics, and if I have my own time for beginning or refusing, she too has hers. This is the spirit in which we should approach a creature so reserved and so utterly self-sufficing. This is the only key we have to that natural distinction of character which repels careless and unobservant natures. When I am told that Agrippina is disobedient, ungrateful, cold-hearted, perverse, stupid, treacherous, and cruel, I no longer strive to check the torrent of abuse. I know that Buffon said all this, and much more, about cats, and that people have gone on repeating it ever since principally because these spirited little beasts have remained just what it pleased Providence to make them, have preserved their primitive freedom through centuries of effete and demoralizing civilization. Why, I wonder, should a great many good men and women cherish an unreasonable grudge against one animal because it does not chance to possess the precise qualities of another? my dog fetches my slippers for me every night said a friend triumphantly not long ago he puts them first to warm by the fire and then brings them over to my chair wagging his tail and as proud as punch would your cat do as much for you i'd like to know assuredly not if i waited for agrippina to fetch me shoes or slippers i should have no other resource save to join as speedily as possible one of the barefooted religious orders of italy but, after all, fetching slippers is not the whole duty of domestic pets. As La Fontaine gently reminds us, Tu animal n'a pas toute propriété. We pick no quarrel with a canary because it does not talk like a parrot, nor with a parrot because it does not sing like a canary. We find no fault with a King Charles Spaniel for not flying at the throat of a burglar, nor with a St. Bernard because we cannot put it in our pocket. Agrippina will never make herself serviceable, yet nevertheless is she of inestimable service. How many times have I rested tired eyes on her graceful little body, curled up in a ball and wrapped round with her tail like a parcel, or stretched out luxuriously on my bed, one paw coyly covering her face, the other gently curved inwards, as though clasping an invisible treasure? Asleep or awake, in rest or in motion, grave or gay, Agrippina is always beautiful, and it is better to be beautiful than to fetch and carry from the rising to the setting of the sun. She is droll, too, with an unconscious humor, even in her most serious and sentimental moods. She has quite the longest ears that ever were seen on so small a cat, eyes more solemn than Athene's owl blinking in the sunlight, and an air of supercilious disdain that would have made Diogenes seem young and ardent by her side. Sitting on the library table, under the evening lamp, with her head held high in air, her tall ears as erect as chimneys, and her inscrutable gaze fixed on the darkest corner of the room, Agrippina inspires in the family sentiments of mingled mirthfulness and awe. 
To laugh at her in such moments, however, is to incur her supreme displeasure. I have known her to jump down from the table and walk haughtily out of the room because of a single half-suppressed but wholly indecorous giggle. Schopenhauer has said that the reason domestic pets are so lovable and so helpful to us is because they enjoy, quietly and placidly, the present moment. Life holds no future for them and consequently no care. If they are content, their contentment is absolute, and our jaded and wearied spirits find a natural relief in the sight of creatures whose little cups of happiness can so easily be filled to the brim. Walt Whitman expresses the same thought more coarsely when he acknowledges that he loves the society of animals because they do not sweat and whine over their condition, nor lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins, nor sicken him with discussions of their duty. In truth, that admirable counsel of Sidney Smith's, take short views of life, can be obeyed only by the brutes. For the thought that travels even to the morrow is long enough to destroy our peace of mind, inasmuch as we know not what the morrow may bring forth. But when Agrippina has breakfasted and washed, and sits in the sunlight blinking at me with affectionate contempt, I feel soothed by her absolute and unqualified enjoyment. I know how full my day will be of things that I don't particularly want to do, and that are not particularly worth doing. But for her, time and the world hold only this brief moment of contentment. Slowly the eyes close. Gently the little body is relaxed. Oh, you who strive to relieve your overwrought nerves and cultivate power through repose, watch the exquisite languor of a drowsy cat and despair of imitating such perfect and restful grace. There is a gradual yielding of every muscle to the soft persuasiveness of slumber the flexible frame is curved into tender lines the head nestles lower the paws are tucked out of sight no convulsive throb or start betrays a rebellious alertness only a faint quiver of unconscious satisfaction a faint heaving of the tawny sides a faint gleam of the half-shut yellow eyes and agrippina is asleep I look at her for one wistful moment, and then turn resolutely to my work. It were ignoble to wish myself in her place, and yet how charming to be able to settle down to a nap, sans peur et sans reproche, at ten o'clock in the morning. These, then, are a few of the pleasures to be derived from the society of an amiable cat. And by an amiable cat, I mean one that, while maintaining its own dignity and delicate reserve, is nevertheless affable and condescending in the company of human beings. There is nothing I dislike more than newspaper and magazine stories about priggish pussies, like the children in Sunday school books, that share their food with hungry beasts from the back alleys and show touching fidelity to old blind masters and hunt partridges in a spirit of noble self-sacrifice for consumptive mistresses, and scorn to help themselves to delicacies from the kitchen tables, and arouse their household so often in cases of fire that I should suspect them of starting the conflagrations in order to win applause by giving the alarm. Whatever a real cat may or may not be, it is never a prig and all true lovers of the race have been quick to recognize and appreciate this fact. I value in the cat, says Chateaubriand, that independent and almost ungrateful temper which prevents it from attaching itself to anyone, the indifference with which it passes from the salon to the housetop. When you caress it, it stretches itself out and arches its back responsively, but that is caused by physical pleasure and not, as in the case of the dog, by a silly satisfaction in loving and being faithful to a master who returns thanks in kicks. The cat lives alone, has no need of society, does not obey except when it likes, pretends to sleep that it may see the more clearly, and scratches everything that it can scratch. Here is a sketch spirited enough, and of good outline, but hardly correct in detail. A cat seldom manifests affection, yet is often distinctly social, and likes to see itself the petted minion of a family group. 
agrippina in fact so far from living alone will not if she can help it remain for a moment in a room by herself she is content to have me as a companion perhaps in default of better but if i go upstairs or downstairs in search of a book or my eyeglasses or any one of the countless things that are never where they ought to be agrippina follows closely at my heels Sometimes, when she is fast asleep, I steal softly out of the door, thinking to escape her vigilance. But before I have taken a dozen steps, she is under my feet, mewing a gentle reproach, and putting on all the injured airs of a deserted Ariadne. I should like to think such behavior prompted by affection rather than by curiosity, but in my candid moments I find this pathetic fallacy a difficult sentiment to cherish there are people i am aware who trustfully assert that their pets love them and one such sanguine creature has recently assured the world that no man who boasts the real intimacy and confidence of a cat would dream of calling his four-footed friend puss but is not such a boast rather ill-timed at best how dare any man venture to assert that he possesses the intimacy and confidence of an animal so exclusive and so reserved i doubt if cardinal wolsey in the zenith of his pride and power claimed the intimacy and confidence of the superb cat who sat in a cushioned armchair by his side and reflected with mimic dignity the full-blown honours of the lord high chancellor of england agrippina i am humbly aware grants me neither her intimacy nor her confidence but only her companionship which i endeavour to receive modestly and without flaunting my favours to the world she is displeased and even downcast when i go out and she greets my return with delight thrusting her little grey head between the banisters the instant i open the house door and waving a welcome in mid-air with one ridiculously small paw being but mortal i am naturally pleased with these tokens of esteem but i do not on that account go about with arrogant brow and boast of my intimacy with agrippina i should be laughed at if i did by everybody who is privileged to possess and appreciate a cat as for curiosity that vice which the abbe galliani held to be unknown to animals but which the more astute voltaire detected in every little dog that he saw peering out of the window of its master's coach it is the riding passion of the feline breast a closet door left ajar a box with half-closed lid an open bureau drawer these are the objects that fill a cat with the liveliest interest and delight agrippina watches breathlessly the unfastening of a parcel and tries to hasten matters by clutching actively at the string when its contents are shown her she examines them gravely and then with a sigh of relief settles down to repose the slightest noise disturbs and irritates her until she discovers its cause if she hears a footstep in the hall she runs out to see whose it is and like certain troublesome little people i have known she dearly loves to go to the front door every time the bell is rung from my window she surveys the street with tranquil scrutiny and if boys are playing below she follows their games with a steady scornful stare very different from the wistful eagerness of a friendly dog quivering to join in the sport sometimes the boys catch sight of her and shout up rudely at her window and i can never sufficiently admire agrippina's conduct upon these trying occasions the well-bred composure with which she affects neither to see nor to hear them nor to be aware that there are such objectionable creatures as children in the world sometimes too the terrier that lives next door comes out to sun himself in the street and beholding my cat sitting well out of reach he dances madly up and down the pavement barking with all his might and rearing himself on his short hind legs in a futile attempt to dislodge her then the spirit of evil enters agrippina's little heart the window is open and she creeps to the extreme edge of the stone sill stretches herself at full length peers down smilingly at the frenzied dog dangles one paw enticingly in the air and exerts herself with quiet malice to drive him to desperation her sense of humour is awakened by his frantic efforts and by her own 
absolute security and not until he is spent with exertion and lies panting and exhausted on the bricks does she arch her graceful back stretch her limbs lazily in the sun and with one light bound spring from the window to my desk wisely has moncrief observed that a cat is not merely diverted by everything that moves but is convinced that all nature is occupied exclusively with catering to her diversion there is a charming story told by m chamfleury who has written so much and so admirably about cats of a poor hermit whose piety and asceticism were so great that in a vision he was permitted to behold his place in heaven next to that of st gregory the sovereign pontiff of christendom the hermit who possessed nothing upon earth but a female cat was abashed by the thought that in the next world he was destined to rank with so powerful a prince of the church and perhaps for who knows the secret springs of spiritual pride he fancied that his self-inflicted poverty would win for him an even higher reward whereupon a second revelation made known to him that his detachment from the world was by no means so complete as he imagined for that he loved and valued his cat the sole companion of his solitude more than st gregory loved and valued all his earthly possessions the pope on his throne was the truer ascetic of the two this little tale conveys to us in addition to its excellent moral never more needed than at present a pleasing truth concerning the lovability of cats while they have never attained and never deserve to attain the widespread and somewhat commonplace popularity of dogs their fascination is a more potent and irresistible charm he who yields himself to the sweet seductiveness of a cat is beguiled for ever from the simple honourable friendship of the more generous and open-hearted beast the small domestic sphinx whose inscrutable eyes never soften with affection the fetish animal that comes down to us from the far past adored hated and feared a god in wise and silent egypt a plaything in old rome a hunted and unholy creature suffering one long martyrdom throughout the half-seen dimly fathomed middle ages even now this lovely uncanny pet is capable of inspiring mingled sentiments of horror and devotion those who are under its spell rejoice in their thraldom and like m champfleury's hermit grow strangely wedded to this mute unsympathetic comradeship those who have inherited the old half-fearful aversion render a still finer tribute to the cat's native witchery and power i have seen middle-aged women of dignified and tranquil aspect draw back with unfeigned dismay at the sight of agrippina a little ball of grey and yellow fur curled up in peaceful slumber on the hearth-rug and this instinctive shrinking has nothing in common with the perfectly reasonable fear we entertain for a terrier snapping and snarling at our heels or for a mastiff the size of a calf which our friend assures us is as gentle as a baby but which looks able and ready to tear us limb from limb it may be ignominious to be afraid of dogs but the emotion is one which will bear analysis and explanation we know exactly what it is we fear while the uneasiness with which many people behold a harmless and perfectly indifferent cat is a faint reflection of that superstitious terror which the nineteenth century still borrows occasionally from the ninth we call it by a different name and account for it on purely natural principles in deference to progress but the medieval peasant who beheld his cat steal out like a grey shadow on st john's eve to join in unholy rites felt the same shuddering abhorrence which we witness and wonder at to-day he simplified matters somewhat and eased his troubled mind by killing the beast for cats that ventured forth on the feast of st john or on halloween or on the second wednesday in lent did so at their peril fire blazed for them in every village and even quiet stay-at-homes were too often hunted from their chimney-corners to a cruel death there is a receipt signed in fifteen seventy five by one lucas pomereau 
a board for ever be his name to whom has been paid the sum of a hundred sol parises for having supplied for three years all the cats required for the fire on st john's day and be it remembered that the gracious child afterwards louis the thirteenth interceded with henry the fourth for the lives of these poor animals sacrificed to wicked sport and an unreasoning terror girt around with fear and mystery and subtle associations of evil the cat comes down to us through the centuries and from every land fresh traditions of sorcery claim it for their own in brittany is still whispered the dreadful tale of the cats that danced with sacrilegious glee around the crucifix until their king was slain and in sicily men know that if a black cat serves seven masters in turn he carries the soul of the seventh into hell in russia black cats become devils at the end of seven years and in southern europe they are merely serving their apprenticeship as witches norwegian folklore is rich in ghastly stories like that of the wealthy miller whose mill has been twice burned down on whitsun night and for whom a travelling tailor offers to keep watch the tailor chalks a circle on the floor writes the lord's prayer around it and waits until midnight when a troop of cats rush in and hang a great pot of pitch over the fireplace again and again they try to overturn this pitch but every time the tailor frightens them away and when their leader endeavors stealthily to draw him outside of his magic circle he cuts off her paw with his knife then they all fly howling into the night and the next morning the miller sees with joy his mill standing whole and unharmed but the miller's wife cowers under the bedclothes offering her left hand to the tailor and hiding as best she can her right arm's bleeding stump finer even than this tale is the well-known story which monk lewis told to shelley of a gentleman who late one night went to visit a friend living on the outskirts of a forest in east germany he lost his path and after wandering aimlessly for some time beheld at last a light streaming from the windows of an old and ruined abbey looking in he saw a procession of cats lowering into the grave a small coffin with a crown upon it the sight filled him with horror and spurring his horse he rode away as fast as he could never stopping until he reached his destination long after midnight his friend was still awaiting him and at once he recounted what had happened whereupon a cat that lay sleeping by the fire sprang to its feet cried out then i am the king of the cats and disappeared like a flash up the chimney for my part i consider this the best cat story in all literature full of suggestiveness and terror yet picturesque withal and leaving ample room in the mind for speculation why was not the heir apparent bidden to the royal funeral was there a disputed succession and how were such points settled in the mysterious domain of catland the notion that these animals gather in ghost-haunted churches and castles for their nocturnal revels is one common to all parts of europe we remember how the little maiden of the mountain idol confides to heine that the innocent-looking cat in the chimney corner is really a witch and that at midnight when the storm is high she steals away to the ruined keep where the spirits of the dead wait spellbound for the word that shall waken them in all scenes of impish revelry cats play a prominent part although occasionally by virtue of their dual natures they serve as barriers against the powers of evil there is the old story of the witch's cat that was grateful to the good girl who gave it some ham to eat i may observe here parenthetically that i have never known a cat that would touch ham and there is the fine bit of italian folklore about the servant maid who with no other protector than a black cat ventures to disturb a procession of ghosts on the dreadful night of the dead it is well for you that the cat lies in your arms the angry spirit says to her otherwise what i am you also would be the last pale reflex of a universal tradition i found three years ago in london where the bad behaviour of the westminster cats proverbially the most dissolute and profligate specimens of their race 
has given rise to the pleasant legend of a country house whither these rakish animals retire for nights of gay festivity and whence they return in the early morning jaded repentant and forlorn of late years there has been a rapid and promising growth of what disaffected and alliterative critics call the cat cult and poets and painters vie with one another in celebrating the charms of this long-neglected pet mr m h spielman's beautiful volume in praise of madame henriette rahner and her pictures is a treasure upon which many an ardent lover of cats will cast wandering and wistful glances it is impossible for even the most disciplined spirit not to yearn over these little furry darlings these gentle mischievous lazy irresistible things as for banjo that dear and sentimental kitten with his head on one side like lydia languish and a decorous melancholy suffusing his splendid eyes let any obdurate scorner of the race look at his loveliness and be converted mrs graham m thompson's pretty anthology concerning cats is another step in the right direction a dainty volume of selections from french and english verse where we may find old favorites like cowper's retired cat and calverley's sad memories graceful epitaphs on departed pussies some delightful poems from baudelaire and three no less delightful from the pen of mrs thompson herself whose preface or foreword is enough to win for her at once the friendship and sympathy of the elect the book while it contains a good deal that might well have been omitted is necessarily a small one for poets english poets especially have just begun to sing the praises of the cat as they have for generations sung the praises of the horse and dog nevertheless all english literature and all the literatures of every land are full of charming allusions to this friendly animal allusions the brevity of which only enhances their value those two delicious lines of herrick's for example and the brisk mouse may feast herself with crumbs till that green-eyed kitling comes are worth the whole of wordsworth's solemn poem the kitten and the falling leaves what did wordsworth know of the innate vanity the affection and coquetry of kittenhood he saw the little beast gambling on the wall and he fancied her as innocent as she looked as though any living creature could be as innocent as a kitten looks with touching simplicity he believed her all unconscious of the admiration she was exciting what would little tabby care for the plaudits of the crowd over happy to be proud over wealthy in the treasure of her own exceeding pleasure ah the errant knavery of that kitten the tiny impostor showing off her best tricks and feigning to be occupied exclusively with her own infantile diversion we can see her now prancing and paddling after the leaves and all the while peeping out of the tail of her e at the serene poet and philosopher and waving her naughty tail in glee over his confidence and condescension heine's pretty lines and close beside me the cat sits purring warming her paws at the cheery gleam the flames keep flitting and flicking and whirring my mind is wrapped in a realm of dream find their english echo in the letter shelley writes to peacock describing half wistfully the shrines of the penates whose hymns are the purring of kittens the hissing of kettles the long talks over the past and dead the laugh of children the warm wind of summer filling the quiet house and the pelting storm of winter struggling in vain for entrance how incomplete would these pictures be how incomplete is any fireside sketch without the purring kitten or drowsy cat the queen i am of that cosy place as with ilka paw i dicked my face i sing and purr with mickle grace this is the sphinx of the hearthstone the little god of domesticity whose presence turns a house into a home even the chilly desolation of a hotel may be rendered endurable by these affable and discriminating creatures for one of them we know once welcomed sir walter scott and softened for him the unfamiliar and unloved surroundings there are no dogs in the hotel where i lodge he writes to abbotsford from london but a tolerably conversable cat 
who eats a mess of cream with me in the morning of course it did the wise and lynx-eyed beast i make no doubt that day after day and week after week that cat had wandered superbly among the common throng of lodgers showing favor to none and growing cynical and disillusioned by constant contact with a crowd then one morning it spied the noble rugged face which neither man nor beast could look upon without loving and forthwith tendered its allegiance on the spot only tolerably conversable it was this reserved and town-bred animal less urbane because less happy than the much respected retainer at abbotsford master hints of hinsfield whom sir walter called his friend ah mon grand ami vous avez tué mon autre grand ami he sighed when the huge hound nimrod ended poor hints's placid career and if scott sometimes seems to disparage cats as when he unkindly compares oliver le dane to one in quentin durward he atones for such indignity by the use of the little pronoun who when writing of the london puss my own habit is to say who on similar occasions and i am glad to have so excellent an authority it were an endless though a pleasant task to recount all that has been said and well said in praise of the cat by those who have rightly valued her companionship m loti's moumoute blanche and moumoute chinoise are well known and widely beloved and m theophile gautier's charming pages are too familiar for comment who has not read with delight of the black and white dynasties that for so long ruled the gentle sway over his hearth and heart of madame theophile who thought the parrot was a green chicken of don pierrot de navarre who deeply resented his master's staying out late at night of the graceful and fastidious seraphita the gluttonous enjolras the acute bohemian gavroche the courteous and well-mannered eponine who received m gautier's guests in the drawing-room and dined at his table taking each course as it was served and restraining any rude distaste for food not to her fancy her place was laid without a knife and fork indeed but with a glass and she went regularly through dinner from soup to dessert awaiting her turn to be helped and behaving with a quiet propriety which most children might imitate with advantage at the first stroke of the bell she would appear and when i came into the dining-room she would be at her post upright on her chair her forepaws on the edge of the tablecloth and she would present her smooth forehead to be kissed like a well-bred little girl who was affectionately polite to relatives and old people i have read this pretty description several times to agrippina who is extremely wayward and capricious about her food rejecting plaintively one day the viands which she has eaten with apparent enjoyment the day before in fact the difficulty of catering to her is so well understood by tradesmen that recently when the housemaid carried her on an errand to the grocery agrippina is very fond of these jaunts and of the admiration she excites the grocer a fatherly man with cats of his own said briskly is this the little lady who eats the biscuits and presented her on the spot with several choice varieties from which to choose she is fastidious too about the way in which her meals are served disliking any other dishes than her own which are of blue and white china requiring that her meat should be cut up fine and all the fat removed and that her morning oatmeal should be well sugared and creamed milk she holds in scorn my friends tell me sometimes that it is not the common custom of cats to receive so much attention at table and that it is my fault agrippina is so exacting but such grumblers fail to take into consideration the marked individuality that is the charm of every kindly treated puss she differs from her sisters as widely as one woman differs from another and reveals varying characteristics of good and evil varying powers of intelligence and adaptation she scales splendid heights of virtue and unlike sir thomas brown is singular in offences even those primitive instincts which we believe all animals hold in common are lost in acquired ethics and depravity no heroism could surpass that of the london cat who crawled back five times under the stage of the burning theatre to rescue her litter of kittens 
and having carried four of them to safety perished devotedly with the fifth on the other hand i know of a cat who drowned her three kittens in a water butt for no reason apparently save to be rid of them and that she might lie in peace on the hearth-rug a murder well planned deliberate and cruel so tiberius might have sat had tiberius been a cat only in her grace and beauty her love of comfort her dignity of bearing her courteous reserve and her independence of character does puss remain immutable and unchanged these are the traits which win for her the warmest corner by the fire and the unshaken regard of those who value her friendship and aspire to her affection these are the traits so subtly suggested by mrs thompson in a sonnet which every true lover of cats feels in his heart must have been addressed to his own particular pet half gentle kindness and half disdain thou comest to my call serenely suave with humming speech and gracious gestures grave in salutation courtly and urbane yet i must humble me thy grace to gain for wiles may win thee but no arts enslave and nowhere gladly thou abidest save where naught disturbs the concord of thy reign sphinx of my quiet hearth who deign'st to dwell friend of my toil companion of my knees thine is the lore of ra and ramses that men forget dost thou remember well beholden still in blinking reveries with sombre sea-green gaze inscrutable End of section one. Section two of Essays in Idleness by Agnes Replier. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. The Children's Poets. Now and then I hear it affirmed by sad voiced pessimists whispering in the gloom that people do not read as much poetry in our day as they did in our grandfathers that this is distinctly the era of prose and that the poet is no longer as shelley claimed the unacknowledged legislator of the world perhaps these cheerless statements are true though it would be more agreeable not to believe them perhaps with the exception of browning whom we study because he is difficult to understand and of shakespeare whom we read because it is hard to content our souls without him the poets have slipped away from our crowded lives and are best known to us through the medium of their reviewers we are always wandering from the paths of pleasure and this may be one of our deviations yet what matters it after all while around us on every side in schoolrooms and nurseries in quiet corners and by cheerful fires the children are reading poetry reading it with a joyous enthusiasm and an absolute surrendering of spirit which we can all remember but can never feel again well might st beuve speak bravely of the clear fine penetration peculiar to childhood well might he recall with wistful sighs that instinctive knowledge which afterwards ripens into judgment but of which the fresh lucidity remains for ever unapproached he knew as all critics have known that it is only the child who responds swiftly pliantly and unreservedly to the allurements of the imagination he knew that when poetry is in question it is better to feel than to think and that with the growth of a guarded and disciplined intelligence straining after the enjoyment which perfection in literary art can give the first careless rapture of youth fades into a half-remembered dream if we are disposed to doubt the love that children bear to poetry a love concerning which they exhibit a good deal of reticence let us consider only the alacrity with which they study for their own delight the poems that please them best how should we fare i wonder if tried by a similar test how should we like to sit down and commit to memory tennyson's enoni or locksley hall or byron's apostrophe to the ocean or the battle scene in marmion yet i have known children to whom every word of these and many other poems was as familiar as the alphabet and a great deal more familiar thank heaven than the multiplication table or the capitals of the united states a rightly constituted child may find the paths of knowledge hopelessly barred by a single page of geography or by a single sum in fractions but he will range at pleasure through the paths of poetry having the open sesame to every door 
sir walter scott who was essentially a rightly constituted child did not even wait for a formal introduction to his letters but managed to learn the ballad of hardy canute before he knew how to read and went shouting it about the house warming his baby blood to fighting point and training himself in very infancy to voice the splendors of his manhood he remembered this ballad too and loved it all his life reciting it once with vast enthusiasm to lord byron whose own unhappy childhood had been softened and vivified by the same innocent delights in truth the most charming thing about youth is the tenacity of its impressions if we had the time and courage to study a dozen verses to-day we should probably forget eleven of them in a fortnight but the poetry we learned as children remains for the most part indelibly fixed in our memories and constitutes a little golden treasury of our own more dear and valuable to us than any other collection because it contains only our chosen favorites and is always within the reach of reference once when i was very young i asked a girl companion well known now in the world of literature if she did not grow weary waiting for trains which were always late at the suburban station where she went to school oh no was the cheerful reply if i have no book and there is no one here to talk with i walk up and down the platform and think over the poetry that i know admirable occupation for an idle minute even the tedium of railway travelling loses half its horrors if one can withdraw at pleasure into the society of the poets and soothed by their gentle and harmonious voices forget the irksome recurrence of familiar things it has often been demonstrated and as often forgotten that children do not need to have poetry written down to their intellectual level and do not love to see the stately muse ostentatiously bending to their ear in the matter of prose it seems necessary for them to have a literature of their own over which they linger willingly for a little while as though in the sunny antechamber of a king but in the golden palace of the poets there is no period of probation there is no enforced attendance upon petty things the clear-eyed children go straight to the heart of the mystery and recognize in the music of words in the enduring charm of metrical quality an element of never-ending delight when to this simple sensuous pleasure is added the enchantment of poetic images lovely and veiled and dimly understood then the delight grows sweeter and keener the child's soul flowers into a conscious love of poetry and one lifelong source of happiness is gained but it is never through infantine or juvenile verses that the end is reached there is no poet dearer to the young than tennyson and it was not the least of his joys to know that all over the english-speaking world children were tuning their hearts to the music of his lines were dreaming vaguely and rapturously over the beauty he revealed therefore the insult seemed greater and more wanton when this beloved idol of our nurseries deliberately offered to his eager audience such anxiously babyish verses as those about minnie and winnie and the little city maiden who goes straying among the flowers is there in christendom a child who wants to be told by one of the greatest of poets that minnie and winnie slept in a shell that the shell was pink within and silver without and that sounds of the great sea wandered about two bright stars peeped into the shell what are they dreaming of who can tell started a green linnet out of the croft wake little ladies the sun is aloft it is not in these tones that poetry speaks to the childish soul though it is too often in this fashion that the poet strives to adjust himself to what he thinks is the childish standard he lowers his sublime head from the stars and pipes with painstaking flatness on a little reed while the children wander far away and listen breathlessly to older and dreamier strains she left the web she left the loom she made three paces through the room she saw the water lily bloom she saw the helmet and the plume she looked down to camelot out flew the web and floated wide the mirror cracked from side to side the curse is come upon me cried the lady of shalott 
here is the mystic note that childhood loves and here too is the sweet constraint of linked rhymes that makes music for its ears how many of us can remember well our early joy in this poem which was but as another and more exquisite fairy tale ranking fitly with anderson's little mermaid and undine and all sad stories of unhappy lives and who shall forget the sombre passion of oriana of those wailing verses that rang through our little hearts like the shrill sobbing of winter storms of that strange tragedy that oppressed us more with fear than pity when the long dun wolds are ribbed with snow and loud the norland whirlwinds blow oriana alone i wander to and fro oriana if any one be inclined to think that children must understand poetry in order to appreciate and enjoy it that one enchanted line when the long dun wolds are ribbed with snow should be sufficient to undeceive him for ever the spell of those finely chosen words lies in the shadowy and half-seen picture they convey a picture with indistinct outlines as of an unknown land where the desolate spirit wanders moaning in the gloom the whole poem is inexpressibly alluring to an imaginative child and its atmosphere of bleak despondency darkens suddenly into horror at the breaking off of the last line from visions of the grave and of peaceful death i hear the roaring of the sea oriana the same grace of indistinctness though linked with the gentler mood and with the softer music makes the lullaby in the princess a lasting delight to children while the petty cradle song in sea dreams beginning what does little birdie say in her nest at peep of day has never won their hearts its motive is too apparent its nursery flavor too pronounced it has none of the condescension of minnie and winnie and grown people can read it with pleasure but a simple statement of obvious truths or a simple line of obvious reasoning however dexterously narrated in prose or verse has not the art to hold a youthful soul in thrall if it be a matter of interest to know what poets are most dear to the children around us to the ordinary apple-eating little boys and girls for whom we are hardly brave enough to predict a shining future it is delightful to be told by favorite authors and by well-loved men of letters what poets first bewitched their ardent infant minds it is especially pleasant to have mr andrew lang admit us a little way into his confidence and confess to us that he disliked tam o'shanter when his father read it aloud to him preferring very sensibly to take my warlocks and bogies with great seriousness of course he did and the sympathies of all children are with him in his choice the ghastly details of that witch's sabbath are far beyond a child's limited knowledge of demonology in the scotch dialect tam's escape and maggie's final catastrophe seem like insults offered to the powers of darkness only the humor of the situation is apparent and humor is seldom to the childish mind a desirable element of poetry not all the spirit of caldecott's illustrations can make john gilpin a real favorite in our nurseries while the jackdaw of reams is popular simply because children being proof against cynicism accept the story as it is told with much misplaced sympathy for the thievish bird and many secret rejoicings over his restoration to grace and feathers as for the pied piper of hamlin its humor is swallowed up in tragedy and the terror of what is to come helps little readers over such sad stumbling blocks as so munch on crunch on take your nuncheon breakfast dinner supper luncheon lines which are every whit as painful to their ears as to ours i have often wondered how the infant southies and coleridges that bright-eyed group of alert and charming children all afire with romantic impulses received the cataract of lodore when papa southey condescended to read it in the schoolroom what well-bred efforts to appear pleased and grateful what secret repulsion to a senseless clatter of words as remote from the silvery sweetness the cadenced music of falling waters as from the unalterable requirements of poetic art and moreover he tasked me to tell him in rhyme ah 
unwise little son to whose rash request generations of children have owed the presence in readers and elocution books and volumes of select lyrics for the nursery of those hated and hateful verses poetry came to me with sir walter scott says mr lang with marmion and the last minstrel and the lady of the lake read for the twentieth time and ever with fresh delight poetry came to scott with shakespeare studied rapturously by firelight in his mother's dressing-room when all the household thought him fast asleep and with pope's translation of the iliad that royal road over which the muse has stepped smiling into many a boyish heart poetry came to pope poor little lame lad with spencer's fairy queen with the brave adventures of strong valiant knights who go forth unblemished and unfrightened to do battle with dragons and paynims cruel and so the links of the magic chain are woven and child hands down to child the spell that holds the centuries together i cannot bear to hear the unkind things which even the most tolerant of critics are wont to say about pope's iliad remembering as i do how many boys have received from its pages their first poetic stimulus their first awakening to noble things what a charming picture we have of coleridge a feeble petulant child tossing with fever on his little bed and of his brother francis stealing up in defiance of all orders to sit by his side and read him pope's translation of homer the bond that drew these boys together was forged in such breathless moments and in such mutual pleasures for francis the handsome spirited sailor lad who climbed trees and robbed orchards and led all dangerous sports had a little in common with his small silent precocious brother frank had a violent love of beating me muses coleridge in a tone of mild complaint and no wonder we think for a more beatable child than samuel taylor it would have been hard to find but whenever that was superseded by any humor or circumstance he was very fond of me and used to regard me with a strange mixture of admiration and contempt more contempt than admiration probably yet was all resentment forgotten and all unkindness at an end while one boy read to the other the story of hector and patroclus and of great ajax with sorrow in his heart pacing round his dead comrade as a tawny lioness paces round her young when she sees the hunters coming through the woods as a companion picture to this we have little dante gabriel rossetti playing othello in the nursery and so carried away by the passionate impulse of these lines in aleppo once where a malignant and a turban turk beat a venetian and traduced the state i took by throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus that he struck himself fiercely on the breast with an iron chisel and fainted under the blow we can hardly believe that shakespeare is beyond the mental grasp of childhood when scott at seven crept out of bed on winter nights to read king henry the fourth and rossetti at nine was overwhelmed by the agony of othello's remorse on the other hand there are writers and very brilliant writers too whose early lives appear to have been undisturbed by such keenly imaginative pastimes and for whom there are no well-loved and familiar figures illumined for ever in that bright clear undying light that borders the edge of the oblivion of infancy count tolstoy confesses himself to have been half hurt half puzzled by his fellow students at the university of moscow who seemed to him so coarse and inelegant and yet who had read and enjoyed so much pushkin and zukovsky were literature to them he says wistfully and not as to me little books in yellow bindings which i had studied as a child but how one wonders could pushkin have remained merely a little book in yellow binding to any boy who had had the happiness of studying him as a child pushkin is the russian byron and embodies in his poems the same spirit of restless discontent of dejected languor of passionate revolt not revolt against the czar which is a limited and individual judgment but revolt against the bitter penalties of life which is a sentiment common to the youth of all nations and of every age yet there are englishmen who have no word save that of scorn for byron 
and i feel uncertain whether such critics ever enjoyed the privilege of being boys at all if to george meredith's composed and complacent mind there strays any wanton recollection of young impetuous days how can he write with pen of gall these worse than churlish lines on manfred projected from the bilious child this clatterjaw his foot could set on alps without a breast beguiled to glow in shedding rascal sweat somewhere about his grinder teeth he mouthed of thoughts that grilled beneath and summoned nature to her feud with bile and buskin attitude there is more of this pretty poem but i have quoted as much as my own irascibility can bear i at least have been a child and have spent some of my childhood's happiest hours with manfred on the alps and have with him beheld the tall pines dwindled as to shrubs in dizziness of distance and have believed with all a child's sincerity in his remorseful gloom for i have ceased to justify my deeds unto myself the last infirmity of evil every line is inexpressibly dear to me now recalling as it does the time when i was in my father's house and my path ran down with butter and honey once more i see the big bare old-fashioned parlour to dust which was my daily task my mother having striven long and vainly to teach my idle little hands some useful housewifely accomplishment in one corner stood a console table with chilly perian ornaments on top and underneath a pile of heavy books wordsworth moore the poems of francis sergeant osgood no lack of variety here the lady of the lake and byron in an embossed brown binding with closely printed double columns well calculated to dim the keenest sight in christendom not that mysterious and malignant mountain which rose frowning from the sea and drew all ships shattered to its feet was more irresistible in its attraction than this brown bulky byron i could not pass it by my dusty never got beyond the table where it lay but sitting crumpled on the floor with the enchanted volume on my lap i speedily forgot everything in the world save only the wandering child who nay in virtue's way did take delight or the corsair or mazeppa or manfred best loved of that dark group perhaps byron is not considered wholesome reading for little girls in these careful days when expurgated editions of the vicar of wakefield and paul in virginia find favour in our nurseries on this score i have no defence to offer and i am not proposing the poet as a safe textbook for early youth but having never been told that there was such a thing as forbidden fruit in literature i was spared at least that alert curiosity concerning it which is one of the most unpleasant results of our present guarded system moreover we have goethe's word for it that byron is not as immoral as the newspapers and certainly he is more agreeable reading i do sincerely believe that if part of his attraction for the young lies in what mr pater calls the grieved dejection the endless regret which to the undisciplined soul sounds like the true murmur of life a better part lies in his large grasp of nature not nature in her minute and lovely detail but in her vast outlines her salient features her solemn majesty and strength crags and misty mountain tops storm-swept skies and the blue bosom of the restless deep these are the aspects of nature that childhood prizes and loves to hear described in vigorous verse the pink-tipped daisy the yellow primrose and the freckled nest eggs hatching in the hawthorn tree belong to a late state of development eugenie de guerin who recognized as clearly as st beuve the fine penetration peculiar to children and who regarded them ever with half wistful half wondering delight has written some very charming suggestions about the kind of poetry pure fresh joyous and delicate which she considers proper food for these highly idealized little people angels upon earth the only discouraging part of her pretty pleading is her frank admission that in french literature at least there is no such poetry as she describes which shows how hard it is to conciliate an exclusive theory of excellence 
she endeavoured sincerely in her infantines to remedy this defect to speak to childhood in its own language and her verses on juju the angel of the playthings are quaintly conceived and full of gentle fancies no child is strongly moved or taught the enduring delight of song by such lines as these but most children will take a genuine pleasure in the baby angel who played with little abel under the myrtle trees who made the first doll and blew the first bubble and who finds a friend in every tiny boy and girl born into this big grey world strange to say he has his english counterpart in mr robert louis stevenson's unseen playmate that shadowy companion whose home is the cave dug by childish hands and who is ready to share all games in the most engaging spirit of accommodation tis he when you play with your soldiers of tin that sides with the frenchman and never can win a touch of combative veracity which brings us down at once from mademoiselle de gorin's fancy flights to the real playground where real children very faintly resembling angels upon earth are busy with mimic warfare mr stevenson is one of the few poets whose verses written especially for the nursery have found their way straight into little hearts his charming style his quick keen sympathy and the ease with which he enters into that brilliant world of imagination wherein children habitually dwell make him their natural friend and minstrel if some of the rhymes in a child's garden of verses seem a trifle bald and babyish even these are guiltless of condescension while others like travel shadow march and the land of story-books are instinct with poetic life i can only regret that a picture so faultless in detail as shadow march where we see the crawling darkness peer through the window-pane and hear the beating of the little boy's heart as he creeps fearfully up the stair should be marred at its close by a single line of false imagery all the wicked shadows coming tramp 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 with the black night overhead so fine an artist as mr stevenson must know that shadows do not tramp and that the recurrence of a short vigorous word which tells so admirably in scott's william and helen and wherever the effect of sound combined with motion is to be conveyed is sadly out of place in describing the ghostly things that glide with horrible noiselessness at the feet of the frightened lad children moreover are keenly alive to the value and the suggestiveness of terms a little eight-year-old girl of my acquaintance who was reciting lord ullen's daughter stopped short at these lines adown the glen rode armed men their trampling sounded nearer and called out excitedly don't you hear the horses she at least heard them as if with the swift apprehension of fear heard them loud above the sound of winds and waters and rendered her unconscious tribute of praise to the sympathetic selection of words there is as we know a great deal of poetry written every year for childish readers some of it makes its appearance in christmas books which are so beautifully bound and illustrated that the little foolish feeble verses are forgiven and in fact forgotten ignored altogether amid more important accessories better poems than these are published in children's periodicals where they form a notable feature and are i dare say read by the young people whose tastes are catered to in this fashion those of us who are familiar with these periodicals either weeklies or monthlies are well aware that the verses they offer may be easily divided into three classes first mere rhymes and jingles intended for very little readers and with which it would be simple churlishness to quarrel they do not aspire to be poetry they are sometimes very amusing and they have an easy swing that is pleasant alike to young ears and old it must be a hard heart that does not sympathize with the unlucky and ill-mated gnome who was full of fun and frolic but his wife was melancholic or with the small damsel in pigtail and pinafore who comforts herself at the piano with this engaging but dubious maxim practising is good for a good little girl it makes her nose straight and it makes her hair curl 
the second kind of verse appears to be written solely for the sake of the accompanying illustration and is often the work of the illustrator who is more at home with his pencil than his pen occasionally it is comic occasionally sentimental or descriptive for the most part it is something in this style the elf and the bumblebee o oh, bumblebee bumblebee don't fly so near or you will tumble me over i fear o oh, funny elf funny elf don't be alarmed i am looking for honey elf you shan't be harmed then tarry o oh, tarry bee fill up your sack and carry o oh, carry me now what child will read more than once these empty little verses very prettily illustrated when it is in his power to turn back to other sprites that sing in different strains to the fairy who wanders over hill over dale through bush through briar seeking pearl eardrops for the cowslip's ears or to that softer shape the music of whose song once heard haunts us for ever full fathom five thy father lies of his bones are coral made those are pearls that were his eyes nothing of him that doth fade but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange these are the sweet mysterious echoes of true fairyland where shakespeare and little children wander at their will poems of the third class are intended for growing girls and boys and aspire to be considered literature they are well written as a rule with a smooth fluency that seems to be the distinguishing gift of our minor verse-makers who even when they have least to say say it with unbroken sweetness and grace this pretty easy insignificance is much better adapted to adult readers who demand little of poets beyond brevity than to children who love large issues real passions fine emotions and a heroic attitude in life pleasant thoughts couched in pleasant language trivial details and photographic bits of description make no lasting appeal to the expansive imagination of a child analysis is wasted upon him altogether because he sees things swiftly and sees them as a whole he may disregard fine shading and minute merits but there are no boundaries to his wandering vision small sciences are the labors of our manhood but the round universe is the plaything of the boy the painful lack of distinction in most of the poetry prepared especially for him chills his fine ardor and dulls his imagination subtle verses about moods and tempers calculated to make healthy little readers emulate miss martineau's peevish self-sympathy melancholy verses about young children who suffer poverty and disaster weird and unintelligible verses with all poe's indistinctness and none of his music commonplace verses about bootblacks and newsboys descriptive verses about snowstorms and april showers pious verses about infant prigs verses of every kind all on the same level of agreeable mediocrity and all warranted to be so harmless that a baby could hear them without blushing why the child who reads young lochinvar is richer in that one good and gallant poem than the child who has all these modern substitutes heaped yearly at his foolish feet for the question at issue is not what kind of poetry is wholesome for children but what kind of poetry do children love in nineteen cases out of twenty that which they love is good for them and they can guide themselves a great deal better than we can hope to guide them i once asked a friend who had spent many years in teaching little girls and boys whether her small pupils when left to their own discretion ever chose any of the pretty trivial verses out of new books and magazines for study and recitation she answered never they turned instinctively to the same old favorites she had been listening to so long to the same familiar poems that their fathers and mothers had probably studied and recited before them hohenlinden glenara lord ellen's daughter young lochinvar rosabel to lucasta on going to the wars the lullaby from the princess lady clara verdever annabel lee longfellow's translation of the castle by the sea and the skeleton in armor these are the themes of which children never weary these are the songs that are sung forever in their secret paradise of delights 
the little volumes containing such tried and proven friends grow shabby with much handling and i have seen them marked all over with mysterious crosses and dots and stars each of which denoted the exact degree of affection which the child bore to the poem thus honored and approved i can fancy mr lang's blue poetry book fairly covered with such badges of distinction for never before has any selection of poems appealed so clearly and insistently to childish tastes and hearts when i turn over its pages i feel as if the children of england must have brought their favorite songs to mr lang and prayed each one that his own darling might be admitted as if they must have forced his choice into their chosen channels its only rival in the field palgrave's children's treasury of english song is edited with such nice discrimination such critical reserve that it is well-nigh flawless a triumph of delicacy and good taste but much that childhood loves is necessarily excluded from a volume so small and so carefully considered the older poets it is true are generously treated herrick especially makes a braver show than he does in mr lang's collection and there are plenty of beautiful ballads some of which like the lass of lochroyan we miss sorely from the pages of the blue poetry book on the other hand where in mr palgrave's treasury are those lovely snatches of song familiar to our earliest years and which we welcome individually with a thrill of pleasure as mr lang shows them to us once more rose aylmer county guy proud Maisie, how sleep the brave nora's vow the delight of my own childhood the pathetic farewell it was afore our rifle king we left fair scotland's strand it was afore our rifle king we e'er saw irish land and hood's silvery little verses beginning a lake and a ferry boat to sail in the midnight clear and merrily we would float from the dragons that watch us here all these and many more are gathered safely into this charming volume nothing we long to see appears to be left out except indeed waller's go lovely rose and herrick's night piece both of them very serious omissions it seems strange to find seven of edgar poe's poems in a collection which excludes the night piece so true a favorite with all girl children and a favorite that once rightfully established can never be thrust from our affections as for praed's red fisherman mr lang has somewhere recorded his liking for this sombre tale which i think embodies everything that a child ought not to love it is the only poem in the book that i wish elsewhere but perhaps this is a perverse prejudice on my part there may be little readers to whom its savage cynicism and gloom carry a pleasing terror like that which oppressed my infant soul as i lingered with goodman brown in the awful witch-haunted forest where hawthorne has shown us the triumph of evil things it is his excursions into the unknown world which the child enjoys says mr lang and how shall we set a limit to his wanderings he journeys far with careless secure footsteps and for him the stars sing in their spheres and fairies dance in the moonlight and the hoarse clashing of arms rings bravely from hard-won fields and lovers fly together under the stormy skies he rides with lochinvar and sails with sir patrick spens into the northern seas and chases the red deer with allen a dale and stands by marmion's side in the thick of the ghastly fray he has given his heart to helen of troy and to the maid of saragossa and to the pale child who met her death on the cruel gordon spears and to the lady with yellow hair who knelt moaning by bartram's bier his friends are bold robin hood and lancelot de loc and the white-plumed henry of navarre and the princely scapegrace who robbed the robbers to make laughter for a month and a good jest for ever a lordly company these and seldom to be found in the grey walks of middle age robin hood dwells not on the stock exchange and prince hal dare not show his laughing face before societies for levelling thrones and reorganizing the universe we adults pass our days alas in the town of stupidity a board of bunyan's soul 
and our companions are mr worldly wise man and mr despondency and mr wantwit still scrubbing his ethiopian and mr feeble mind and the deplorable young woman named dull but it is better to be young and to see the golden light of romance in the skies and to kiss the white feet of helen as she stands like a star on the battlements it is better to follow hector to the fight and guinevere to the sad cloisters of almsbury and the ancient mariner to that silent sea where the death-fires gleam by night even to us who have made these magic voyages in our childhood there comes straying at times a pale reflection of that early radiance a faint sweet echo of that early song then the streets of the town of stupidity grow soft to tread and falstaff's great laugh frightens mr despondency into a shadow then madeline smiles on us under the wintry moonlight and Pophiro steals by with strange sweets heaped in baskets of wreathed silver then we know that with the poets there is perpetual youth and that for us as for the child dreaming in the firelight the shining casements open upon fairyland end of section two Section three of Essays in Idleness by Agnes Replier. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. The Praises of War When the world was younger and perhaps merrier, when people lived more and thought less, and when the curious subtleties of an advanced civilization had not yet turned men's heads with conceit of their own enlightening progress from simple to serious things, poets had two recognized sources of inspiration which were sufficient for themselves and for their unexacting audiences they sang of love and they sang of war of fair women and brave men of keen youthful passions and of the dear delights of battle sweet rosamond lingers in woodstock bower and sir colleen wrestles with the eldridge knight annie of lochroyan sails over the roughening seas and lord percy rides gaily to the cheviot hills with fifteen hundred bowmen at his back it did not occur to the thick-headed generation who first listened to the ballad of chevy chase to hint that the game was hardly worth the candle or that poaching on a large scale was as reprehensible ethically as poaching on a little one this sort of insight was left for the nineteenth-century philosopher and the nineteenth-century moralist in earlier easier days the last thing that a poet troubled himself about was a defensible motive for the battle in which his soul exulted his business was to describe the fighting not to justify the fight which would have been a task of pure supererogation in that truculent age fancy trying to justify kinmont willie or johnny of bradesley instead of counting the hard knocks they give and the stout men they lay low johnny set his back against an ache his foot against a stain and he has slain the seven foresters he has slain them ah but ain the last echo of this purely irresponsible spirit may be found in the war songs of dinis var where peacock always three hundred years behind his time sings of slaughter with a bellicose cheerfulness which only his admirable versification can excuse the mountain sheep are sweeter but the valley sheep are fatter we therefore deemed it meeter to carry off the latter we made an expedition we met a host and quelled it we forced a strong position and killed the men who held it there is not even a lack of food at home the old traditional dinner of spurs to warrant this foray there is no hint of necessity for the harriers or consideration for the harried we brought away from battle and much their land bemoaned them two thousand head of cattle and the head of him who owned them ednefed king of defed his head was born before us his wine and beasts supplied our feasts and his overthrow our chorus it is impossible to censure a deed so irresistibly narrated but if the lines were a hairbreadth less mellifluous i think we should call this a very barbarous method of campaigning when the old warlike spirit was dying out of english verse when poets had begun to meditate and moralize to interpret nature and to counsel man the good gods gave to england as a link with the days that were dead sir walter scott 
who sang as no Briton before or since has ever sung of battlefields and the hoarse clashing of arms, of brave deeds and midnight perils, of the outlaw riding by Brignall banks, and the trooper shaking his silver bridle reins upon the river shore. Adieu for evermore, my love, and adieu for evermore. These are not precisely the themes which enjoy unshaken popularity today. The poet of battles fares ill in modern England, says Sir Francis Doyle, and as a consequence there are many people who speak slightingly of Scott's poetry, and who appear to claim for themselves some inscrutable superiority by doing so. They give you to understand, without putting it too coarsely into words, that they are beyond that sort of thing, but that they liked it very well as children, and are pleased if you enjoy it still. There is even a class of unfortunates who, through no apparent fault of their own, have ceased to take delight in Scott's novels, and who manifest a curious indignation because the characters in them go ahead and do things, instead of thinking and talking about them, which is the present approved fashion of evolving fiction. Why, what time have the good people in Quentin Durward for speculation and chatter? The rush of events carries them irresistibly into action they plot they fight and run away and scour the country and meet with so many adventures and perform so many brave and cruel deeds that they have no chance for introspection and the joys of analysis naturally those writers who pride themselves upon making a story out of nothing and who are more concerned with excluding material than with telling their tales have scant liking for sir walter who thought little and prated not at all about the art of fiction but used the subjects which came to hand with the instinctive and unhesitating skill of a great artist the battles in quentin durward and old mortality are i think as fine in their way as the battle of flodden and flodden says mr lang is the finest fight on record better even than the stand of aeus by the ships in the iliad better than the slaying of the wooers in the odyssey the ability to carry us whither he would to show us whatever he pleased and to stir our heart's blood with the story of old unhappy far-off things and battles long ago was the especial gift of scott of the man whose sympathies were as deep as life itself whose outlook was as wide as the broad bosom of the earth he trod on he believed in action and he delighted in describing it the thinker's voluntary death in life was not for him the power that moves the world but rather deeds deeds that make history and that sing themselves forever he honestly felt himself to be a much smaller man than wellington he stood abashed in the presence of the soldier who had led large issues and controlled the fate of nations he would have been sincerely amused to learn from robert ellesmere what a delicious thing it is to contemplate sir walter reading robert ellesmere that the decisive events of the world take place in the intellect the decisive events of the world scott held to take place in the field of action on the plains of marathon and waterloo rather than in the brain tissues of william godwin he knew what befell athens when she could put forward no surer defence against philip of macedon than the most brilliant orations ever written in praise of freedom it was better he probably thought to argue as the english did in platoons the schoolboy who fought with the heroic greenbreeks in the streets of edinburgh the student who led the tory youths in their gallant struggle with the riotous irishmen and drove them with stout cudgelling out of the theatre they had disgraced the man who broken in health and spirit was yet blithe and ready to back his quarrel with gourgaud by giving that gentleman any satisfaction he desired was consistent throughout with the simple principles of a bygone generation it is clear to me he writes in his journal that what is least forgiven in a man of any mark or likelihood is want of that article blackguardly called pluck all the fine qualities of genius cannot make amends for it we are told the genius of poets especially is irreconcilable with this species of grenadier accomplishment if so quelle chaine de genie 
quel chien de genie indeed and far beyond the compass of scott who amid the growing sordidness and seriousness of an industrial and discontented age struck a single resonant note that rings in our hearts to-day like the echo of good and joyous things sound sound the clarion fill the fife to all the sensual world proclaim one crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name the same sentiments are put it may be remembered into admirable prose when graham of claverhouse expounds to henry morton his views on living and dying at present philosophy and philanthropy between them are hustling poor glory into a small corner of the field even to the soldier we are told it should be a secondary consideration or perhaps no consideration at all his sense of duty being a sufficient stay but scott like homer held somewhat different views and absolutely declined to let that jade duty have everything her own way it is the plain duty of blount and eustace to stay by clare's side and guard her as they were bidden instead of which they rush off with sir walter's tacit approbation to the fray no longer blount the view could bear by heaven and all its saints i swear i will not see it lost fitz eustace you with lady clare may bid your beads and patter prayer i gallop to the host it was this cheerful acknowledgment of human nature as a large factor in life which gave to scott his genial sympathy with brave imperfect men which enabled him to draw with true and kindly art such soldiers as le balafre and dugald dalgetty and william of de lorraine le balafre indeed with his thick-headed loyalty his conceit of his own wisdom his unswerving almost unconscious courage his readiness to risk his neck for a bride and his reluctance to marry her is every whit as voracious as if he were the over-analyzed child of realism instead of one of the many minor characters thrust with wanton prodigality into the pages of a romantic novel alone among modern poets scott sings homerically of strife others have caught the note but none have upheld it with such sustained force such clear and joyous resonance macaulay has fire and spirit but he is always too rhetorical too declamatory for real emotion he stirs brave hearts it is true and the finest tribute to his eloquence was paid by mrs browning who said she could not read the lays lying down they drew her irresistibly to her feet but when macaulay sings of lake regulus i do not see the battle swim before my eyes i see whether i want to or not a platform and the poet's own beloved schoolboy declaiming with appropriate gestures those glowing and vigorous lines when scott sings of flodden i stand wraith-like in the thickest of the fray i know how the scottish ranks waver and reel before the charge of stanley's men how tunstall's stainless banner sweeps the field and how in the gathering gloom the stubborn spearmen still made good their dark impenetrable wood each stepping where his comrade stood the instant that he fell there is none of this noble simplicity in the somewhat dramatic ardour of horatius or in the pharisaical flavour inevitable perhaps but not the less depressing of naseby and ivory which read a little like old kaiser william's war dispatches turned into verse better a thousand times are the splendid swing the captivating enthusiasm of drayton's agincourt which hardly a muckworm could hear unstirred reading it we are as keen for battle as were king harry's soldiers straining at the leash the ardour for strife the staying power of quiet courage all are here and here too a felicity of language that makes each noble name a trumpet blast of defiance a fresh incentive to heroic deeds with spanish yew so strong arrows a cloth yard long that like to serpents stung piercing the weather none from his fellow starts but playing manly parts and like true english hearts stuck close together warwick in blood did wade 
Oxford the foe invade, and cruel slaughter made still as they ran up. Suffolk his axe did ply, Beaumont and Willoughby bear them right doughtily, Ferrers and Fanhope. Upon St. Crispin's day fought was this noble fray, which fame did not delay to England to carry. O oh, when shall Englishmen with such acts fill a pen, or England breed again such a King Harry? Political economists and chilly historians, and all long-headed calculating creatures, generally may, perhaps, hint that invading France was no part of England's business, and represented fruitless labor and bloodshed. But this happily is not the poet's point of view. He dreams with Hotspur of basilisks, of cannon, culverin, of prisoners' ransom, and of soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. He hears King Harry's voice ring clearly above the cries and clamors of battle. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. And to him the fierce scaling of Harfleur in the field of Agincourt seem not only glorious but righteous things. That pure and generous desire to thrash the person opposed to you because he is opposed to you, because he is not your side, which Mr. Sainsbury declares to be the real incentive of all good war songs, hardly permits a too cautious analysis of motives. Fighting is not a strictly philanthropic pastime, and its merits are not precisely the merits of church guilds and college settlements. Warlike saints are rare in the calendar, notwithstanding the splendid example of Michael, of celestial armies, prince. And there is at present a shameless conspiracy on foot to defraud even St. George of his hard-won glory, and to melt him over in some modern crucible into a peaceful Alexandrian bishop. An Arian bishop, too, by way of deepening the scandal." We shall hear next that St. Denis was a Calvinistic minister, and St. Iago, whom devout Spanish eyes have seen mounted in the hottest of the fray, was a friendly well-wisher of the Moors. But why sigh over fighting saints in a day when even fighting sinners have scant measure of praise? Moral courage is everything. Physical heroism is a small matter, often trivial enough, wrote that clever, emotional, sensitive German woman, Rahel Varnhagen, at the very time when a little physical heroism might have freed her conquered fatherland. And this profession of faith has gone on increasing in popularity, until we have even a lad like the young Lawrence Oliphant, with hot blood surging in his veins, gravely recording his displeasure because a parson, with a Crimean medal on his surplice, preached a rousing battle sermon to the English soldiers who had no alternative but to fight. My natural man, confesses Oliphant naively, is intensely warlike, which is just as low a passion as avarice or any other. A curious moral perspective, which needs no word of comment, and sufficiently explains much that was to follow. We are irresistibly reminded by such a verdict of Shelley's swelling lines. War is the statesman's game, the priest's delight the lawyer's jest, the hired assassin's trade. Lines which, to borrow a witticism of Mr. Oscar Wilde's, have all the vitality of error, and will probably be quoted triumphantly by peace societies for many years to come. In the meantime, there is a remarkable and very significant tendency to praise all war songs, war stories, and war literature generally, in proportion to the discomfort and horror they excite in proportion to their inartistic and unjustifiable realism. I well remember, when I was a little girl, having a dismal French tale by Erkman Chatrian called Le Conscrit, given me by a kindly disposed but mistaken friend, and the disgust with which I waded through those scenes of sordid bloodshed and misery, untouched by any fire of enthusiasm, any halo of romance. The very first description of Napoleon, Napoleon, the idol of my youthful dreams, as a fat, pale man with a tuft of hair upon his forehead, filled me with loathing for all that was to follow. But I believe I finished the book. It never occurred to me in those innocent days not to finish every book that I began. 
and then i re-read in joyous haste all of sir walter scott's fighting novels waverley old mortality ivanhoe quentin durward and even the abbot which has one good battle to get the taste of that abominable story out of my mouth of late years however i have heard a great deal of french russian and occasionally even english literature commended for the very qualities which aroused my childish indignation no one has sung the praises of war more gallantly than mr rudyard kipling yet those grim verses called the grave of the hundred dead verses closely resembling the appalling specimens of truculency with which mr ruskin began and ended his brief poetical career have been singled out from their braver brethren for a special praise and offered as grim naked ugly truth to those who would know more of the poet's picturesque qualities but grim naked ugly truth can never be made a picturesque quality and it is not the particular business of a battle poem to emphasize the desirability of peace we all know the melancholy anti-climax of campbell's splendid song ye mariners of england when to three admirable verses the poet must needs add a fourth descriptive of the joys of harmony and of the eating and drinking which shall replace the perils of the sea i counted a lasting injury after having my blood fired with these surging lines where blake and mighty nelson fell your manly heart shall glow as ye sweep through the deep while the stormy winds do blow while the battle rages loud and long and the stormy winds do blow to be suddenly introduced to a scene of inglorious junketing and i am not surprised that campbell's peculiar inspiration which was born of war and of war only failed him the instant he deserted his theme such shocking lines as the meteor flag of england shall yet terrific burn while quite in harmony with the poet's ordinary achievements would have been simply impossible in those first three verses of ye mariners where he remains true to his one artistic impulse he strikes a different and a finer note when in the battle of the baltic he turns gravely away from feasting and jollity to remember the brave men who have died for england's glory let us think of them that sleep full many a fathom deep by thy wild and stormy steep elsinore to go back to mr rudyard kipling however from whom i have wandered far he is more in love with the dear delights of battle than with its dismal carnage and he wins an easy forgiveness for a few horrors by showing us much brave and hearty fighting who can forget the little gurkhas drawing a deep breath of contentment when at last they see the foe and gaping expectantly at their officers as terriers grin ere the stone is cast for them to fetch who can forget the joyous abandon with which mulvaney the disreputable and his four-and-twenty young ones fling themselves upon lung tung pen it is a good and wholesome thing for a man to be in sympathy with that primitive virtue courage to recognize it promptly and to do honor to it under any flag homer's heart is with the brave of either side observes mr lang with glaucus and sarpedon of lycia no less than with achilles and patroclus scott's heart is with surrey and dacre no less than with lennox and argyle with the english hosts charging like whirlwinds to the fray no less than with the scottish soldiers standing ringed and dauntless around their king theodore de bonville hot with shame over fallen france cheeks his bitterness to write some tender verses to the memory of a prussian boy found dead on the field with a bullet-pierced volume of pindar on his breast dumas that lover of all brave deeds cries out with noble enthusiasm that it was not enough to kill the highlanders at waterloo we had to push them down and the reverse of the medal has been shown to us by mr lang in the letter of an english officer who writes home that he would have given the rest of his life to have served with the french cavalry on that awful day sir francis doyle delights like an honest and stout-hearted briton to pay an equal tribute of praise in rather questionable verse to the private of the buffs poor reckless rude low-born untaught bewildered and alone who died for england's honor in a far-off land 
and to the indian prince merab khan who brought to bay swore proudly that he would perish to the last the lord of all that man can call his own and fell beneath the english bayonets at the door of his zenana this is the spirit by which brave men know one another the world over and which lying back of all healthy national prejudices unites in a human brotherhood those whom the nearness of death has taught to start at no shadows o oh, east is east and west is west and never the two shall meet till earth and sky stand presently at god's great judgment seat but there is neither east nor west border nor breed nor birth when two strong men stand face to face though they come from the ends of the earth here is mr kipling at his best and here too is a link somewhat simpler and readier to hand than that much desired bond of cultivation which mr oscar wilde assures us will one day knit the world together the time when germany will no longer hate france because the prose of france is perfect seems still as far off as it is fair the day when intellectual criticism will bind europe together dawns only in the dreamland of desire mr wilde makes himself merry at the expense of peace societies so dear to the sentimentalists and proposals for unarmed international arbitration so popular among those who have never read history but criticism the mediator of the future will annihilate race prejudices by insisting upon the unity of the human mind in the variety of its forms if we are tempted to make war upon another nation we shall remember that we are seeking to destroy an element of our own culture and possibly its most important element this restraining impulse will allow us to fight only red indians and fijians and bushmen from whom no grace of culture is to be gleaned and it may prove a strong inducement to some disturbed countries like ireland and russia to advance a little further along the paths of sweetness and light meanwhile the world which rolls so easily in old and well-worn ways will probably remember that power is measured by resistance and will go on arguing stolidly in platoons all healthy men like fighting and like the sense of danger all brave women like to hear of their fighting and of their facing danger says mr ruskin who has taken upon himself the defence of war in his own irresistibly unconvincing manner others indeed have delighted in it from a purely artistic standpoint or as a powerful stimulus to fancy mr saintsbury exults more than most critics in battle poems and in those half inarticulate songs that set the blood coursing sir francis doyle whose simple manly soul never wearied of such themes had no ambition to outgrow the first hearty sympathies of his boyhood i knew the battle in marmion by heart almost before i could read he writes in his reminiscences and i cannot raise out i do not wish to raise out of my soul all that filled and coloured it in years gone by mr frode who is as easily seduced by the picturesqueness of a sea-fight as was canon kingsley appears to believe in all seriousness that the british privateers who went plundering in the spanish main were inspired by a pure love for england and a zeal for the protestant faith he can say truly with the little boy of adventurous humour there is something that suits my mind to a t in the thought of a regular pirate king mr lang's love of all warlike literature is too well known to need comment as a child he confesses he pored over the fightiness parts of the bible when sunday deprived him of less hallowed reading as a boy he devoted to sir walter scott the precious hours which were presumably sacred to the shrine of latin grammar as a man he lures us with glowing words from the consideration of political problems or of our own complicated spiritual machinery to follow the fortunes of the brave fierce men who fought in the lonely north or of the heroes who went forth in gilded armour to win glory or to give it before the walls of troy in these days when many people find it easier to read the ring in the book than the iliad mr lang makes a strong plea in behalf of that literature which has come down to us out of the past to stand for evermore unrivalled and alone stirring the hearts of all generations until human nature shall be warped from simple and natural lines 
with the bible and shakespeare he says the homeric poems are the best training for life there is no good quality that they lack manliness courage reverence for old age and for the hospitable hearth justice piety pity a brave attitude towards life and death all are conspicuous in homer it might be well perhaps to add to this long list one more incomparable virtue an instinctive and illogical delight in living amid shipwrecks and battles amid long wanderings and hurtling spears amid sharp dangers and sorrows bitter to bear homer teaches us and teaches us in right joyful fashion the beauty and value of an existence which we profess nowadays to find a little burdensome on our hands all these things have the lovers of war said to us and in all these ways have they striven to fire our hearts but mr ruskin is not content to regard any matter from a purely artistic standpoint or to judge it on natural and congenital lines he must endorse it ethically or condemn accordingly it is not enough for him as it would be for any other man to claim that no great art ever yet rose on earth but among a nation of soldiers he feels it necessary to ask himself some searching and embarrassing questions about fighting for its own sake and as a grand pastime questions which he naturally finds extremely difficult to answer it is not enough for him to say with equal truth and justice that if brave death in a red coat be no better than brave life in a black one it is at least every bit as good he must needs wax serious and commit himself to this strong and doubtful statement assume the knight merely to have ridden out occasionally to fight his neighbor for exercise assume him even a soldier of fortune and to have gained his bread and filled his purse at the sword's point still i feel as if it were somehow grander and worthier in him to have made his bread by sword-play than any other play i had rather he had made it by thrusting than by batting much more than by betting much rather that he should ride war-horses than back race-horses and i say it sternly and deliberately much rather would i have him slay his neighbor than cheat him perhaps in deciding a point as delicate as this it would not be altogether amiss to consult the subject acted upon in other words the neighbor who whatever may be his prejudice against dishonest handling might probably prefer it to the last irredeemable disaster in this commercial age we get tolerably accustomed to being cheated like the skinned eel we are used to it but there is an old rhyme which tells us plainly that a broken neck is beyond all help of healing no it is best when we treat a theme as many-sided as war to abandon modern inquisitorial methods and confine ourselves to that good old-fashioned simplicity which was content to take short obvious views of life it is best to leave ethics alone and ride as lightly as we may the finest poems of battle and of camp have been written in this unencumbered spirit as for example that lovely little snatch of song from rokeby a weary lot is thine fair maid a weary lot is thine to pull the thorn thy brow to braid and press the rue for wine a lightsome eye a soldier's mane a feather of the blue a doublet of the lincoln green no more of me you knew my love no more of me you knew and this other far less familiar which i quote from lockhart's spanish ballads and which is fitly called the wandering night song my ornaments are arms my pastime is in war my bed is cold upon the wold my lamp yon star my journeyings are long my slumbers short and broken from hill to hill i wander still kissing thy token i ride from land to land i sail from sea to sea some day more kind i fate may find some night kiss thee now apart from the charming felicity of these lines we cannot but be struck with their singleness of conception and purpose the wandering knight is well nigh as disencumbered of mental as of material luggage he rides as free from our tangled perplexity of introspection as from our irksome contrivances for comfort 
it is not that he is particularly guileless or ignorant one does not journey far over the world without learning the world's ways and the ways of the men who dwell upon her but the knowledge of things looked at from the outside is never the knowledge that wears one's soul away and the travelling companion that lord byron found so ennuyant the blight of life the demon thought forms no part of the wandering knight's equipment as i read this little fugitive song which has drifted down into an alien age i feel an envious liking for those days when the tumult of existence made its triumph when action fanned the embers of joy and when people were too busy with each hour of life as it came to question the usefulness or desirability of the whole there is one more point to consider mr saintsbury appears to think it strange that battles when they occur and especially when they chance to be victories should not immediately inspire good war songs but this is seldom or never the case the charge of the light brigade being an honourable exception to the rule drayton's heroic ballad was written nearly two hundred years after the battle of agincourt flodden is a tale of defeat and campbell whose songs are so intoxicatingly warlike belonged i am sorry to say to the peace at all price party the fact that a battle fought five hundred years ago is just as inspiring to the poet as a battle fought yesterday and a brave deed the memory of which comes down to us through centuries stirs our hearts as profoundly as though we witnessed it in our own time sarpedon leaping lightly from his chariot to dare an unequal combat the wounded knight schoenberg dragging himself painfully from amid the dead and dying to offer his silver shield to his defenceless emperor the twenty kinsmen of the noble family of trautsmansdorf who fell under frederick of austria in the single battle of muldorf the english lad young anstruter who carried the queen's colours of the royal welsh at the storming of sebastopol and who swift-footed as a schoolboy was the first to gain the great redoubt and stood there one happy moment holding his flagstaff and breathing hard before he was shot dead these are the pictures whose value distance can never lessen and whose colours time can never dim these are the deeds that belong to all ages and to all nations a heritage for every man who walks this troubled earth all this the gods have fashioned and have woven the skein of death for men that there might be a song in the ears even of the folk of after time end of section three Section four of Essays in Idleness by Agnes Replier. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Leisure. Zounds! How has he the leisure to be sick? A visitor strolling through the noble woods of Fernay complimented Voltaire on the splendid growth of his trees. I, replied the great wit, half in scorn and half perhaps in envy, they have nothing else to do and walked on deigning no further word of approbation has it been more than a hundred years since this distinctly modern sentiment was uttered more than a hundred years since the spreading chestnut boughs bent kindly over the lean strenuous caustic disappointed man of genius who always had so much to do and who found in the doing of it a mingled bliss and bitterness that scorched him like fever pain how is it that while dr johnson's sledge-hammer repartees sound like the sonorous echoes of a past age voltaire's remarks always appear to have been spoken the day before yesterday they are the kind of witticisms which we do not say for ourselves simply because we are not witty but they illustrate with biting accuracy the spirit of restlessness of disquiet of intellectual vanity and keen contention which is the brand of our vehement and overzealous generation the gospel of work that is the phrase woven insistently into every homily every appeal made to the conscience or the intelligence of a people who are now straining their youthful energy to its utmost speed blessed be drudgery that is the text deliberately chosen for a discourse which has enjoyed such amazing popularity that sixty thousand printed copies have been found 
all inadequate to supply the ravenous demand readers of dickens if anyone has the time to read dickens nowadays may remember miss monflather's inspired amendment of that familiar poem concerning the busy bee in work 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 in work all way let my first years be past and when our first years are past the same program is considered adequate and satisfactory to the end a whole lifetime of horrid industry to quote mr badgett's uninspired words this is the prize dangled alluringly before our tired eyes and if we are disposed to look askance upon the booty then vanity is subtly pricked to give zest to faltering resolution our virtues would be proud if our faults whipped them not they would be laggards in the field if our faults did not sometimes spur them to action it is the paean of orators and from what is courteously called literature that keeps our courage screwed to the sticking-place and veils the occasional bareness of the result with a charitable vesture of self-delusion work is good no one seriously doubts this truth adam may have doubted it when he first took spade in hand and eve when she scoured her first pots and kettles but in the course of a few thousand years we have learned to know and value this honest troublesome faithful and extremely exacting friend but work is not the only good thing in the world it is not a fetish to be adored neither is it to be judged like a sum in addition by its outward and immediate results the god of labor does not abide exclusively in the rolling mill the law courts or the cornfield he has a twin sister whose name is leisure and in her society he lingers now and then to the lasting gain of both saint beuve writing of mademoiselle de sevigne and her time says that we with our habits of positive occupation can scarcely form a just conception of that life of leisure and chit-chat conversations were infinite admits mademoiselle sevigne herself recalling the long summer afternoons when she and her guests walked in the charming woods of les rochers until the shadows of twilight fell the whole duty of life seemed to be concentrated in the pleasant task of entertaining your friends when they were with you or writing them admirable letters when they were absent occasionally there came even to this tranquil and finely poised french woman a haunting consciousness that there might be other and harder work for human hands to do nothing is accomplished day by day she writes doubtfully and life is made up of days and we grow old and die this troubled her a little when she was all the while doing work that was to last for generations work that was to give pleasure to men and women whose great-grandfathers were then unborn not that we have the time now to read mademoiselle de sevigne why there are big volumes of these delightful letters and who can afford to read big volumes of anything merely for the sake of the enjoyment to be extracted therefrom it was all very well for saint beuve to say lisons tout mademoiselle de sevigne when the question arose how should some long idle days in a country house be profitably enjoyed it was all very well for saint beuve to plead with touching confidence in the intellectual pastimes of his contemporaries let us treat mademoiselle de sevigne as we treat clarissa harlowe when we have a fortnight of leisure and rainy weather in the country a fortnight of leisure and rainy weather in the country the words would be antiquated even for dr johnson rain may fall or rain may cease but leisure comes not so lightly to our calling nay saint beuve's wistful amazement at the polished and cultivated inactivity which alone could produce such a correspondence as mademoiselle de sevigne is not greater than our wistful amazement at the critic's conception of possible idleness in bad weather in one respect at least we follow his good counsel we do treat mademoiselle de sevigne precisely as we treat clarissa harlowe that is we leave them both severely alone as being utterly beyond the reach of what we are pleased to call our time and what of the leisure of montaigne who taking his life in his two hands disposed of it as he thought fit with no restless self-accusations on the score of indolence 
in the world and of the world yet always able to meet and greet the happy solitude of gascony toiling with no thought of toil but rather to entertain my spirit as it best pleased this man wrought out of time a coin which passes current over the reading world and what of horace who enjoyed an industrious idleness the bare description of which sets our hearts aching with desire the picture which horace draws of himself in his country home says an envious english critic affords us a delightful glimpse of such literary leisure as is only possible in the golden days of good harun al rashid horace goes to bed and gets up when he likes there was no one to drag him down to the law courts the first thing in the morning to remind him of an important engagement with his brother scribes to solicit his interest with Messinus, or to tease him about public affairs and the latest news from abroad he can bury himself in his greek authors or ramble through the woody glens which lie at the foot of mount ustica without a thought of business or a feeling that he ought to be otherwise engaged swim smoothly in the stream of thy nature and live but one man counsels sir thomas brown and it may be this gentle current will bear us as bravely through life as if we buffeted our strength away in the restless ocean of endeavour leisure has a value of its own it is not a mere handmaid of labour it is something we should know how to cultivate to use and to enjoy it has a distinct and honourable place wherever nations are released from the pressure of their first rude needs their first homely toil and rise to happier levels of grace and intellectual repose civilization in its final outcome says the keen young author of the chevalier of pensier di vani is heavily in the debt of leisure and the success of any society worth considering is to be estimated largely by the use to which its fortunati put their spare moments here is a sentiment so relentlessly true that nobody wants to believe it we prefer uttering agreeable platitudes concerning the blessedness of drudgery and the iniquity of eating bread earned by another's hands yet the creation of an artistic and intellectual atmosphere in which workers can work the expansion of a noble sympathy with all that is finest and most beautiful the jealous guardianship of whatever makes the glory and distinction of a nation this is achievement enough for the fortunati of any land and this is the debt they owe it can hardly be denied that the lack of scholarship of classical scholarship especially at our universities is due primarily to the labour worship which is the prevalent superstition of our day and which like all superstitions has gradually degraded its god into an idol and lost sight of the higher powers and attributes beyond the student who is pleased to think a knowledge of german more useful than a knowledge of greek the parent who deliberately declares that his boys have no time to waste over homer the man who closes the doors of his mind to everything that does not bear directly on mathematics or chemistry or engineering or whatever he calls work all these plead in excuse the exigencies of life the absolute and imperative necessity of labour it would appear then that we have no fortunati that we are not yet rich enough to afford the greatest of all luxuries leisure to cultivate and enjoy the best that has been known and thought in the world this is a pity because there seems to be money in plenty for so many less valuable things the yearly taxes of the united states sound to innocent ears like the fabled wealth of the orient the yearly expenditures of the people are on no rigid scale yet we are too poor to harbour the priceless literature of the past because it is not a paying investment because it will not put bread in our mouths nor clothes on our shivering nakedness poverty is a most odious calling sighed burton many years ago and we have good cause to echo his lament until we are able to believe with that enthusiastic greek scholar mr butcher that intellectual training is an end in itself and not a mere preparation for a trade or a profession 
until we begin to understand that there is a leisure which does not mean an easy sauntering through life but a special form of activity employing all our faculties and training us to the adequate reception of whatever is most valuable in literature and art until we learn to estimate the fruits of self-culture at their proper worth we are still far from reaping the harvest of three centuries of toil and struggle we are still as remote as ever from the serenity of intellectual accomplishment there is a strange pleasure in work wedded to leisure in work which has grown beautiful because its rude necessities are softened and humanized by sentiment and the subtle grace of association a little paragraph from the journal of eugenie de guerin illustrates with charming simplicity the gilding of common toil by the delicate touch of a cultivated and sympathetic intelligence a day spent in spreading out a large wash leaves little to say and yet it is rather pretty too to lay the white linen on the grass or to see it float on lines one may fancy oneself homer's nausicaa or one of those biblical princesses who washed their brother's tunics we have a basin at moulinas that you have never seen sufficiently large and full to the brim of water it embellishes the hollow and attracts the birds who like a cool place to sing in in the same spirit maurice de guerin confesses frankly the pleasure he takes in gathering faggots for the winter fire that little task of the woodcutter which brings us close to nature and which was also a favorite occupation of madame de lamenay the faggot gathering indeed can hardly be said to have assumed the proportions of real toil it was rather a pastime where play was thinly disguised by a pretty semblance of drudgery idleness admits diggerine but idleness full of thought and alive to every impression eugenie's labors however had other aspects and bore different fruit there is nothing intrinsically charming in stitching seams hanging out clothes or scorching one's fingers over a kitchen fire yet every page in the journal of this nobly born french girl reveals to us the nearness of work work made sacred by the prompt fulfillment of visible duties and what is more rare made beautiful by that distinction of mind which was the result of alternating hours of finely cultivated leisure a very ordinary and estimable young woman might have spread her wash upon the grass with honest pride at the whiteness of her linen but it needed the solitude of lekela the few books well read and well worth reading the life of patriarchal simplicity and the habit of sustained and delicate thought to awaken in the worker's mind the graceful association of ideas the pretty picture of nausicaa and her maidens cleansing their finely woven webs in the cool rippling tide for it is self-culture that warms the chilly earth wherein no good seed can mature it is self-culture that distinguishes between the work which has inherent and lasting value and the work which represents conscientious activity and no more and for the training of one's self leisure is requisite leisure and that rare modesty which turns a man's thoughts back into his own shortcomings and requirements and extinguishes in him the burning desire to enlighten his fellow-beings we might make ourselves spiritual by detaching ourselves from action and become perfect by the rejection of energy says mr oscar wilde who delights in scandalizing his patient readers and who lapses unconsciously into something resembling animation over the wrongs inflicted by the solemn preceptors of mankind the notion that it is worth while to learn a thing only if you intend to impart it to others is widespread and exceedingly popular i have myself heard an excellent and anxious aunt say to her young niece then working hard at college but my dear why do you give so much of your time to greek you don't expect to teach it do you as if there were no other use to be gained no other pleasure to be won from that noble language in which lies hidden the hoarded treasure of the centuries 
to study greek in order to read and enjoy it and thereby make life better worth the living is a possibility that seldom enters the practical modern mind yet this restless desire to give out information like alms is at best a questionable bounty this determination to share one's wisdom with one's unwilling fellow-creatures is a noble impulse provocative of general discontent when southey writing to james murray about a dialogue which he proposes to publish in the quarterly says with characteristic complacency i have very little doubt that it will excite considerable attention and lead many persons into a wholesome train of thought we feel at once how absolutely familiar is the sentiment and how absolutely hopeless is literature approached in this spirit the same principle working under different conditions to-day entangles us in a network of lectures which have become the chosen field for every educational novelty and the diversion of the mentally unemployed charles lamb has recorded distinctly his veneration for the old-fashioned schoolmaster who taught his greek and latin in leisurely fashion day after day with no thought wasted upon more superficial or practical acquirements and who came to his task as to a sport he has made equally plain his aversion for the new-fangled pedagogue new in his time at least who could not relish a beggar or a gypsy without seeking to collect or to impart some statistical information on the subject a gentleman of this caliber his fellow-traveller in a coach once asked him if he had ever made any calculation as to the value of the rental of all the retail shops in london and the magnitude of the question so overwhelmed lamb that he could not even stammer out a confession of his ignorance to go preach to the first passer-by to become tutor to the ignorance of the first thing i meet is a task i abhor observes montaigne who must certainly have been the most acceptable companion of his day dr johnson too had scant sympathy with insistent and arrogant industry he could work hard enough when circumstances demanded it but he always felt an inclination to do nothing and not infrequently gratified his desires no man sir is obliged to do as much as he can a man should have part of his life to himself was the good doctor's soundly heterodox view advanced upon many occasions he hated to hear people boast of their assiduity and nipped such vain pretensions in the bud with frosty scorn when he and boswell journeyed together in the harwich stage-coach a fat elderly gentlewoman who had been talking freely of her own affairs wound up by saying that she never permitted any of her children to be for a moment idle i wish madam said dr johnson testily that you would educate me too for i have been an idle fellow all my life i am sure sir protested the woman with dismayed politeness you have not been idle madam was the retort it is true and that gentleman there pointing to poor young boswell has been idle also he was idle in edinburgh his father sent him to glasgow where he continued to be idle he came to london where he has been very idle and now he is going to utrecht where he will be as idle as ever that there was a background of truth in these spirited assertions we have every reason to be grateful dr johnson's value to-day does not depend on the number of essays or reviews or dedications he wrote in a year some years he wrote nothing but on his own sturdy and splendid personality the real primate the soul's teacher of all england says carlyle a great embodiment of uncompromising goodness and sense every generation needs such a man not to compile dictionaries but to preserve the balance of sanity and few generations are blessed enough to possess him as for boswell he might have toiled in the law courts until he was grey without benefiting or amusing anybody it was in the nights he spent drinking port wine at the mitre and in the days he spent trotting like a terrier at his master's heels that the seed was sown which was to give the world a masterpiece of literature the most delightful biography that has ever enriched mankind 
it is to leisure that we owe the life of johnson and a heavy debt we must in all integrity acknowledge it to be mr shortreed said truly of sir walter scott that he was making himself in the busy idle pleasures of his youth in those long rambles by hill and dale those whimsical adventures in farmhouses those merry purposeless journeys in which the eager lad tasted the flavor of life at home such unauthorized amusements were regarded with emphatic disapprobation i greatly doubt sir said his father to him one day that you were born for nay better than a gangrel scrape-gut and one half pities the grave clerk to the signet whose own life had been so decorously dull and who regarded with affectionate solicitude his lovable and incomprehensible son in later years sir walter recognized keenly that his wasted school hours entailed on him a lasting loss a loss he was determined his son should never know it is to be forever regretted that the most homeric of modern men could not read homer but every day he stole from the town to give to the country every hour he stole from law to give to literature every minute he stole from work to give to pleasure counted in the end as gain it is in his pleasures that a man really lives it is from his leisure that he constructs the true fabric of self perhaps charles lamb's fellow-clerks thought that because his days were spent at a desk in the east india house his life was spent there too his life was far remote from that routine of labor built up of golden moments of respite enriched with joys chastened by sorrows vivified by impulses that had no filiation with his daily toil for the time that a man may call his own he writes to wordsworth that is his life the lamb who worked in the india house and who had no skill in figures has passed away and is to-day but a shadow and a name the lamb of the essays and the letters lives for us now and adds each year his generous share to the innocent gaiety of the world this is the lamb who said riches are chiefly good because they give us time and who sighed for a little son that he might christen him nothing to do and permit him to do nothing End of section four. Section five of Essays in Idleness by Agnes Replier. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Words. Do you read the dictionary? asked Monsieur Theophile Gautier of a young and ardent disciple who had come to him for counsel. It is the most fruitful and interesting of books words have an individual and a relative value they should be chosen before being placed in position this word is a mere pebble that is a fine pearl or an amethyst in art the handicraft is everything and the absolute distinction of the artist lies not so much in his capacity to feel nature as in his power to render it we are always pleased to have a wholesome truth presented to us with such genial vivacity so that we may feel ourselves less edified than diverted and learn our lesson without the mortifying consciousness of ignorance he is a wise preceptor who conceals from us his awful rod of office and grafts his knowledge dexterously upon our self-esteem men must be taught as if you taught them not and things unknown proposed as things forgot an appreciation of words is so rare that everybody naturally thinks he possesses it and this universal sentiment results in the misuse of a material whose beauty enriches the loving student beyond the dreams of avarice musicians know the value of chords painters know the value of colors writers are often so blind to the value of words that they are content with a bare expression of their thoughts disdaining the labor of the file and confident that the phrase first seized is for them the phrase of inspiration they exaggerate the importance of what they have to say lacking which we should be none the poorer and underrate the importance of saying it in such fashion that we may welcome its very moderate significance 
it is in the habitual and summary recognition of the laws of language that scholarship delights says mr pater and while the impatient thinker eager only to impart his views regards these laws as a restriction the true artist finds in them an opportunity and rejoices as goethe rejoiced to work within conditions and limits for every sentence that may be penned or spoken the right words exist they lie concealed in the inexhaustible wealth of a vocabulary enriched by centuries of noble thought and delicate manipulation he who does not find them and fit them into place who accepts the first term which presents itself rather than search for the expression which accurately and beautifully embodies his meaning aspires to mediocrity and is content with failure the exquisite adjustment of a word to its significance which was the instrument of flaubert's daily martyrdom and daily triumph the generous sympathy of a word with its surroundings which was the secret wrung by sir thomas brown from the mysteries of language these are the twin perfections which constitute style and substantiate genius cardinal newman also possesses in an extraordinary degree flaubert's art of fitting his words to the exact thoughts they are designed to convey such a brief sentence as ten thousand difficulties do not make one doubt reveals with pregnant simplicity the mental attitude of the writer sir thomas brown working under fewer restraints and without the severity of intellectual discipline harmonizes each musical syllable into a prose of leisurely sweetness and sonorous strength court not felicity too far and weary not the favorable hand of fortune man is a noble animal splendid in ashes and pompous in the grave the race of delight is short and pleasures have mutable faces such sentences woven with curious skill from the rich fabric of seventeenth-century english defy the wreckage of time in them a gentle dignity of thought finds its appropriate expression and the restfulness of an unvexed mind breathes its quiet beauty into each cadenced line here are no boisterous metaphors such as dryden scorned to give undue emphasis at every turn and amaze the careless reader with the cheap delights of turbulence here is no trace of that full habit of speech hateful to mr arnold's soul and which in the years to come was to be the gift of journalism to literature the felicitous choice of words which with most writers is the result of severe study and unswerving vigilance seems with a favored few who should be envied and not imitated to be the genuine fruit of inspiration as though caprice itself could not lead them far astray shelley's letters and prose papers teem with sentences in which the beautiful words are sufficient satisfaction in themselves and of more value than the conclusions they reveal they have a haunting sweetness a pure perfection which makes the act of reading them a sustained and dulcet pleasure sometimes this effect is produced by a few simple terms reiterated into lingering music we are born and our birth is unremembered and our infancy remembered but in fragments we live on and in living we lose the apprehension of life sometimes a clearer note is struck with the sure and delicate touch which is the excellence of art for the mind in creation is as a fading coal which some invisible influence like an inconstant wind awakens to transitory brightness the substitution of the word glow for brightness would i think make this sentence extremely beautiful if it lacks the fullness and melody of those incomparable passages in which burke the great master of words rivets our admiration for ever it has the same peculiar and lasting hold upon our imaginations and our memories once read we can no more forget its charm than we can forget that chastity of honor which felt a stain like a wound or the mournful cadence of regret over virtues deemed superfluous in an age of strictly iconoclastic progress 
never more shall we behold that generous loyalty to rank and sex that proud submission that dignified obedience that subordination of the heart which kept alive even in servitude itself the spirit of an exalted freedom it is the fashion at present to subtly depreciate burke's power by some patronizing allusion to the grand style a phrase which except when applied to milton appears to hold in solution an undefined and undefinable reproach but until we can produce something better or something as good those long savoursome latin words checked and vivified by racy saxon monosyllables must still represent an excellence which it is easier to belittle than to emulate it is strange that our chilling disapprobation of what we are prone to call fine writing melts into genial applause over the freakish perversity so dear to modern unrest we look askance upon such an old-time master of his craft as the opium-eater and require to be told by a clear-headed unenthusiastic critic like mr george saintsbury that the balanced harmony of de quincey's style is obtained often by the use of extremely simple words couched in the clearest imaginable form placed by the side of mr pater's picture of mona lisa too well known to need quotation de quincey's equally famous description of our lady of darkness both passages are as beautiful as words can make them but the gift of simplicity is in the hands of the older writer or take the single sentence which describes for us the mystery of our lady of sighs and her eyes if they were ever seen would be neither sweet nor subtle no man could read their story they would be found filled with perishing dreams and with wrecks of forgotten delirium here as mr saintsbury justly points out are no needless adjectives no unusual or extravagant words the sense is adequate to the sound and the sound is only what is required as accompaniment to the sense we are not perplexed and startled as when browning introduces us to the tyrene whelk's pearl-sheeted lip or to a woman's morbid olive faultless shoulder blades we are not irritated and confused as when carlyle whose misdeeds like those of browning are matters of pure volition is pleased for our sharper discipline to write like a comet inscribing with its tail no man uses words more admirably or abuses them more shamefully than carlyle that he should delight in seeing his pages studded all over with such spikes as mammonism flunkyhood nonentity and simulacrum that he should repeat them again and again with unwearying self-content is an enigma that defies solution save on the simple presumption that they are designed like other instruments of torture to test the fortitude of the sufferer it is best to scramble over them as bravely as we can and forget our scars in the enjoyment of those vivid and matchless pictures in which each word plays its part and supplies its share of outline and emphasis to the scene the art that can dictate such a brief bit of description as little red-coloured pulpy infants is the art of a dutch master who on five inches of canvas depicts for us with subdued vehemence the absolute realities of life all freaks remarks mr arnold tend to impair the beauty and power of language yet so prone are we to confuse the bizarre with the picturesque that at present a great deal of english literature resembles a linguistic museum where every type of monstrosity is cheerfully exhibited and admired writers of splendid capacity of undeniable originality and force are not ashamed to add their curios to the group either from sheer impatience of restraint or as i sometimes think from a grim and perverted sense of humour which is enlivened by noting how far they can venture beyond bounds when mr george meredith is pleased to tell us that one of his characters neighed a laugh that another told her naughty head that a third stamped her aspect spat and that a fourth was discovered pluming a smile upon his succulent mouth 
we cannot smother a dawning suspicion that he is diverting himself at our expense and pluming a smile of his own more sapless than succulent over the naive simplicity of the public perhaps it is a yearning after subtlety rather than a spirit of uncurbed humour which prompts vernon lee to describe for us carlo's dark renaissance face perplexed with an incipient laugh but really a very interesting and improving little paper might be written on the extraordinary laughs and smiles which cheer the somewhat saturnine pages of modern analytic fiction correctness that humble merit of prose has been snubbed into a recognition of her insignificance she is as tame as a woman with only one head and two arms amid her more striking and richly endowed sisters in the museum a language long employed by a delicate and critical society says mr walter Badgett, is a treasure of dexterous felicities and to awaken the literary conscience to its forgotten duty of guarding this treasure is the avowed vocation of mr pater and of another stylist less understood and less appreciated mr oscar wilde their labors are scantily rewarded in an age which has but little instinct for form and which habitually allows itself the utmost license of phraseology that unblessed freedom from restraint which to the clear-eyed greeks appeared diametrically opposed to a wise and well-ordered liberty and which finds its amplest expression in the poems of walt whitman has dazzled us only to betray the emancipation of the savage is sufficiently comprehensive but his privileges are not always as valuable as they may at first sight appear mr brownell in his admirable volume french traits unhesitatingly defines whitman's slang as the riotous medium of the underlanguaged and the reproach is not too harsh nor too severe even mr g c macaulay one of the most acute and enthusiastic of his english critics admits sadly that it is gutter slang equally purposeless and indefensible that a man who held within himself the elements of greatness should have deliberately lessened the force of his life's work by a wilful misuse of his material is one of those bitter and irremediable errors which sanity forever deplores we are inevitably repelled by the employment of trivial or vulgar words in serious poetry and they become doubly offensive when brought into relation with the beauty and majesty of nature it is neither pleasant nor profitable to hear the sun's rays described as scooting obliquely high and low it is still less satisfactory to have the universe addressed in this convivial and burlesque fashion earth you seem to look for something at my hands say old topknot what do you want there is a kind of humorousness which a true sense of humour would render impossible there is a species of originality from which the artist shrinks aghast and worse than mere vulgarity is the constant employment of words indecorous in themselves and irreverent in their application the smirching of clean and noble things with adjectives grossly unfitted for such use and repellent to all the canons of good taste this is not the gentle pressure which sophocles put upon common words to wring from them a fresh significance it is a deliberate abuse of terms and betrays a lack of that fine quality of self-repression which embraces the power of selection and is the best characteristic of literary morality oh for the style of honest men sighs saint beuve sick of such unreserved disclosures of men who have revered everything worthy of respect whose innate feelings have ever been governed by the principles of good taste oh for the polished pure and moderate writers there is a pitiless french maxim less popular with english and americans than with our gallic neighbours le secret d'envoyer est de tout dire mr pater indeed expresses the same thought in ampler english fashion which but emphasizes the superiority of the french when he says for in truth 
all art does but consist in the removal of surplusage from the last finish of the gem engraver blowing away the last particle of invisible dust back to the earliest divination of the finished work to be lying somewhere according to michelangelo's fancy in the rough hewn block of stone that the literary artist tests his skill by a masterly omission of all that is better left unsaid is a truth widely admitted and scantily utilized authors who have not taken the trouble de faire le toilette admit us with painful frankness into their dressing-rooms and suffer us to gaze more intimately than is agreeable to us upon the dubious mysteries of their deshabille authors who have the gift of continuity disregard with insistent generosity the limits of time and patience what a noble poem was lost to myriads of readers when the ring in the book reached its twenty thousandth line how inexorable is the tyranny of a great and powerful poet who will spare his readers nothing authors who are indifferent to the beauties of reserve charge down upon us with a dreadful impetuosity from which there is no escape the strength that lies in delicacy the chasteness of style which does not abandon itself to every impulse are qualities ill understood by men who subordinate taste to fervour and whose words coarse rank or unctuous betray the undisciplined intellect that mistakes passion for power the language of poets says shelley has always effected a certain uniform and harmonious recurrence of sound without which it were not poetry and it is the sustained effort to secure this balanced harmony this magnificent work within limits which constitutes the achievement of the poet and gives beauty and dignity to his art where is the man who can flatter himself that he knows the language of prose if he has not assiduously practised the language of poetry asks m francisque sarcet whose requirements are needlessly exacting but whose views would have been cordially endorsed by at least one great master of english dryden has always maintained that the admirable quality of his prose was due to his long training in a somewhat mechanical verse a more modern and diverting approximation of m sarcet's views may be found in the robust statement of benjamin franklin i approved for my part the amusing oneself now and then with poetry so far as to improve one's language but no farther it is a pity that people cannot always be born in the right generation what a delicious picture is presented to our fancy of a nineteenth-century franklin amusing himself and improving his language by an occasional study of sordello the absolute mastery of words which is the prerogative of genius can never be acquired by painstaking or revealed to criticism mr lowell pondering deeply on the subject has devoted whole pages to a scholarly analysis of the causes which assisted shakespeare to his unapproached and unapproachable vocabulary the english language was then mr lowell reminds us a living thing hot from the hearts and brains of a people not hardened yet but moltenly ductile to new shapes of sharp and clear relief in the moulds of new thought shakespeare found words ready to his use original and untarnished types of thought whose edges were unworn by repeated impressions no arbitrary line had been drawn between high words and low vulgar then meant simply what was common poetry had not been aliened from the people by the establishment of an upper house of vocables the conception of the poet had no time to cool while he was debating the comparative respectability of this phrase or that but he snatched what word his instinct prompted and saw no indiscretion in making a king speak as his country nurse might have taught him it is a curious thing however that the more we try to account for the miracles of genius the more miraculous they grow we can never hope to understand the secret of homer's style it is best to agree simply with mr pater homer was always saying things in this manner we can never know how keats came to write with beaded bubbles winking at the brim or those other lines perhaps the most beautiful in our language magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairylands forlorn 
it is all a mystery hidden from the uninspired and mr lowell's clean-built scaffolding while it helps us to a comprehensive enjoyment of shakespeare leaves us dumb and amazed as ever before the concentrated splendor of a single line in cradle of the rude imperious surge there is only one way to fathom its conception the great waves reared their foamy heads and whispered him the words the richness of elizabethan english the freedom and delight with which men sounded and explored the charming intricacies of a tongue that was expanding daily into fresh majesty and beauty must have given to literature some of the allurements of navigation mariners sailed away upon stormy seas on strange half-hinted errands haunted by the shadow of glory dazzled by the lustre of wealth scholars ventured far upon the unknown ocean of letters haunted by the seductions of prose dazzled by the fairness of verse they brought back curious spoils gaudy subtle sumptuous according to the taste or potency of the discoverer their words have often a mingled weight and sweetness whether conveying briefly a single thought like burton's touched with the lodestone of love or adding strength and lustre to the ample delineations of ben jonson give me that wit whom praise excites glory puts on or disgrace grieves he is to be nourished with ambition pricked forward with honours checked with reprehension and never to be suspected of sloth bacon's admirable conciseness in which nothing is disregarded but where every word carries its proper value and expresses its exact significance is equalled only by cardinal newman reading maketh a full man conference a ready man and study an exact man says bacon and this simple accuracy of definition reminds us inevitably of the lucid terseness with which every sentence of the apologia reveals the thought it holds the truest expedience is to answer right out when you are asked the wisest economy is to have no management the best prudence is to not be a coward as for the naivete and the picturesqueness which lend such inexpressible charm to the earlier writers and atone for so many of their misdeeds what can be more agreeable than to hear sir walter raleigh remark with cheerful ingenuousness some of our captains garoused of wine till they were reasonable pleasant a most engaging way of narrating a not altogether uncommon occurrence and what can be more winning to the ear than the simple grace with which robert ascham writes of familiar things in the whole year springtime summer fall of the leaf and winter and in one day morning noontime afternoon and eventide altereth the course of the weather the pith of the bow the strength of the man it seems an easy thing to say fall of the leaf for fall and eventide for evening but in such easy things lies the subtle beauty of language in the rejection of such nice distinctions lies the barrenness of common speech we can hardly spare the time in these hurried days to speak of the fall of the leaf to use four words where one would suffice merely because the four words have a graceful significance and the one word has none and so even in composition this finely colored phrase with its hint of russet wind-swept woods is lost to us forever yet compare with it the line which lord tennyson that great master of beautiful words puts into marion's song have you still any honey my dear she said it's the fall of the year but come come how tame and gray is the idiom which conveys a fact which defines a season but suggests nothing to our imaginations by the side of the idiom which brings swiftly before our eyes the brilliant desolation of autumn the narrow vocabulary which is the conversational freehold of people whose education should have provided them a broader field admits of little that is picturesque or forcible and of less that is finely graded or delicately conceived ordinary conversation appears to consist mainly of ands buts and thus with the occasional well 
to give a flavor of nationality a yes or no to stand for individual sentiment and a few widely exaggerated terms to destroy value and perspective is this one wonders the treasure of dexterous felicities which mr badgett contemplated with such delight and which a critical society is destined to preserve flawless and uncontaminated is this the heroic utterance the great mother tongue possessing which we all become or so mr sidney dobell assures us lords of an empire wide as shakespeare's soul sublime as milton's immemorial theme and rich as chaucer's speech and fair as spencer's dream is this the element whose beauty excites mr oscar wilde to such rapturous and finely worded praise praise which awakens in us a noble emulation to prove what we can accomplish with a medium at once so sumptuous and so flexible for the material that painter or sculptor uses is meagre in comparison with language says mr wilde words have not merely music as sweet as that of viol and lute color as rich and vivid as any that makes lovely for us the canvas of the venetian or the spaniard and plastic form no less sure and certain than that which reveals itself in marble or in bronze but thought in passion and spirituality are theirs also are theirs indeed alone if the greeks had criticized nothing but language they would have still been the great art critics of the world to know the principles of the highest art is to know the principles of all the arts this is not claiming too much for in truth mr wilde is sufficiently well equipped to illustrate his claim if his sentences are sometimes overloaded with ornament the decorations are gold not tinsel if his vocabulary is gorgeous it is never glaring if his allusions are fanciful they are controlled and subdued into moderation even the inevitable and swiftly uttered reproach of fine writing cannot altogether blind us to the fact that his are beautiful words pearls and amethysts m gautier would call them aptly chosen and fitted into place with the careful skill of a goldsmith they are free moreover from that vice of unexpectedness which is part of fine writing and which mr sainsbury finds so prevalent among the literary workers of to-day the desire to surprise us by some new and profoundly irrelevant application of a familiar word the veracity of a bar of music the finely executed passage of a marble chimney-piece the andante of a sonnet and the curious statement commonly applied to mr gladstone that he is part of the conscience of a nation these are the vagaries which to mr saintsbury and to every other student of words appears so manifestly discouraging mr james payne tells a pleasant story of an aesthetic sideboard which was described to him as having a chippendale feeling about it before which touching conceit the ever-famous fringes of the north star pale into insignificance a recent editor of shelley's letters and essays says with seeming seriousness in his preface that the witch of atlas is a characteristic outcome an exquisite mouse of fancy brought forth by what mountain of shelleyan imagination now when a careful student and an appreciative reader can bring himself to speak of a poem as a mouse of fancy merely for the sake of forcing a conceit and confronting us with the perils of the unexpected it is time we turn soberly back to first principles and to our dictionaries it is time we listened anew to m gautier's advice and studied the value of words End of section five. section six of essays in idleness by agnes replier the sleeper fox recording is in the public domain ennui tous les genres sont permis or les genres ennuyeux want and ennui says schopenhauer are the two poles of human life the further we escape from one evil the nearer we inevitably draw to the other as soon as the first rude pressure of necessity is relieved and man has leisure to think of something beyond his unsatisfied craving for food and shelter then ennui steps in and claims him for her own it is the price he pays not merely for luxury but for comfort 
time the inexorable taskmaster of poor humanity drives us hard with whip and spur when we are struggling under the heavy burden of work but stays his hand and prolongs the creeping hours when we are delivered over to that weariness of spirit which waits each moment with lead time is in fact either our open oppressor or our false friend he is that agent by which at every instant all things in our hands become as nothing and lose any real value they possess here is a doctrine distinctly discouraging and stated with that relentless candor which compels our reluctant consideration there can be no doubt that to schopenhauer's mind ennui was an evil every whit as palpable as want he hated and feared them both with the painful susceptibility of a self-centred man and he strove resolutely from his youth to protect himself against these twin disasters of life the determined fashion in which he guarded his patrimony from loss resembled the determined fashion in which he strove with less success to guard himself from boredom the vapid talk the little wearisome iterations which most of us bear resignedly enough because custom has taught us patience were to him intolerable afflictions he retaliated by an ungracious dismissal of society as something pitiably and uniformly contemptible his advice has not the grave and simple wisdom of sir thomas brown be able to be alone but is founded rather on voltaire's disdainful maxim the world is full of people who are not worth speaking to and implies an almost savage rejection of one's fellow-beings every fool is pathetically social says schopenhauer and the advantage of solitude consists less in the possession of ourselves than in the escape from others with whimsical eagerness he built barrier after barrier between himself and the dreaded enemy ennui only to see his citadel repeatedly stormed and to find himself at the mercy of his foe there is but one method after all by which the invader can be even partially disarmed and this method was foreign to schopenhauer's nature it was practised habitually by sir walter scott who in addition to his sustained and splendid work threw himself with such unselfish unswerving ardour into the interests of his brother men that he never gave them a thorough chance to bore him they did their part stoutly enough and were doubtless as tiresome as they knew how to be but his invincible sweet temper triumphed over their malignity and enabled him to say in the evening of his life that he had suffered little at their hands and had seldom found any one from whom he could not extract either amusement or edification perhaps his journal tells a different tale a tale of heavy moments stretching into hours and borne with cheerful patience out of simple consideration for others men and women friends and strangers took forcible possession of his golden leisure and he yielded it to them without a murmur that which was well-nigh maddening to carlyle's irritable nerves and selfish petulance and which strained even charles lamb's forbearance to the snapping point sir walter endured smilingly as if it were the most reasonable thing in the world mr lang is right when he says scott did not preach socialism he practised it that is he never permitted himself to assign to his own comfort or convenience a very important place in existence he never supposed his own satisfaction to be the predestined purpose of the universe but his love for genial life his keen enjoyment of social pleasures made him singularly sensitive to ennui he was able indeed like sir thomas brown to be alone when the charity of his fellow-creatures suffered it and he delighted in diverting companionship whether of peers or hinds but the weariness of daily intercourse with stupid people told as heavily upon him as upon less patient victims little notes scattered throughout his journal reveal his misery and awaken sympathetic echoes in every long-tried soul of all bores he writes the greatest is to hear a dull and bashful man sing a facetious song and again with humorous intensity 
miss ayton's father is a bore after the fashion of all fathers mothers aunts and other chaperones of pretty actresses and again this time in a hasty scrawl to ballantyne o oh james o oh james two irish dames oppress me very sore i groaning send one sheet i've penned for hang them there's no more that sir walter forgot his sufferings as soon as they were over is proof not of callousness but of magnanimity he forgave his tormentors the instant they ceased to torment him and then found time to deplore his previous irritation i might at least have asked him to dinner he was heard murmuring self-reproachfully when an unscrupulous intruder had at last departed from abbotsford and on another occasion when some impatient lads refused to emulate his forbearance he recalled them with prompt insistence to their forgotten sense of propriety come come young gentlemen he expostulated it requires no small ability i assure you to be a decided bore you must endeavour to show a little more respect the self-inflicted pangs of ennui are less salutary and infinitely more onerous than those we suffer at the hands of others it is natural that our just resentment when people weary us should result in a temporary taste for solitude a temporary exaltation of our own society like most sentiments erected on an airy trestle-work of vanity this is an agreeable delusion while it lasts but it seldom does last after we are bold enough to put it to the test the inevitable and rational discontent which lies at the bottom of our hearts is not a thing to be banished by noise or lulled to sleep by silence we are not sufficient for ourselves and companionship is not sufficient for us venez monsieur said louis the thirteenth to a listless courtier allons nous ennuyer ensemble we fancy it is the detail of life its small grievances its apparent monotony its fretful cares its hours alternately lagging and feverish that wear out the joy of existence this is not so were each day differently filled the result would be much the same young maurice de guerin struggling with a depression he too clearly understands strikes at the very root of the matter in one dejected sentence mon dieu que je souffre de la vie non dans ces accidents un peu de philosophie et sophie mais dans elle-même dans la substance à part tout phénomène to which the steadfast optimist opposes an admirable retort it is a pity that m de guarin should have permitted himself this relentless analysis of a misery which is never bettered by contemplation happiness may not be as we are sometimes told the legacy of the barbarian but neither is it a final outcome of civilization men can weary and do weary of every stage that represents a step in the world's progress and the ennui of mental starvation is equalled only by the ennui of mental satiety it is curious how much of this temper is reflected in the somewhat dispiriting literature which attains popularity to-day mr hamlin garland whose leaden-hued sketches called i think unfairly main travelled roads have deprived most of us of some cheerful hours paints with an unfaltering hand a life in which ennui sits enthroned it is not the poverty of his western farmers that oppresses us real biting poverty which withers lesser evils with its deadly breath is not known to these people at all they have roofs fire food and clothing it is not the ceaseless labor the rough fare the gray skies the muddy barnyards which stand for the trouble in their lives it is the dreadful weariness of living it is the burden of a dull existence clogged at every pore and the hopeless melancholy of which they have sufficient intelligence to understand theirs is the ennui of emptiness and the implied reproach on every page is that a portion and only a portion of mankind is doomed to walk along these shaded paths while happier mortals who abide in new york or perhaps in paris spend their days in a pleasant tumult of intellectual and artistic excitation 
the clearest denial of this fallacy may be found in that matchless and desolate sketch of mr pater's called sebastian van stork where we have painted for us with penetrating distinctness man's deliberate rejection of those crowded accessories which to the empty-handed represent the joys of life never has the undying essence of ennui been revealed to our unwilling gaze as in this merciless picture never has it been so portrayed in its awful nakedness amid a plenty which it cannot be persuaded to share we see the rich warm highly coloured surroundings the vehement intensity of work and pastime the artistic completeness of every detail the solicitations of love the delicate and alluring touches which give to every day its separate delight its individual value and amid all these things the impatient soul striving vainly to adjust itself to a life which seems so worth the living here indeed is one of fortune's favourites whom she decks with garlands like a sacrificial heifer and at whom unseen she points her mocking finger encompassed from childhood by the thriving genius of the dutch by the restless activity which made dry land and populous towns where nature had willed the sea and by the admirable art which added each year to the heaped-up treasures of holland sebastian van stork has but one vital impulse which shapes itself to an end escape escape from an existence made unendurable by its stifling fullness its vivid and marvellous accomplishment it is an interesting question to determine or to endeavour to determine how far animals share man's melancholy capacity for ennui schopenhauer who like hartmann and all other professional pessimists steadfastly maintains that beasts are happier than men is disposed to believe that in their natural state they never suffer from this malady and that even when domesticated only the most intelligent give any indication of its presence but how does schopenhauer know that which he so confidently affirms the bird impelled by an instinct she is powerless to resist sits patiently on her eggs until they are hatched but who can say she is not weary of the pastime what loneliness and discontent may find expression in the lion's dreadful roar which is said to be as mournful as it is terrible we are naturally tempted in moments of fretfulness and dejection to seek relief not unmixed with envy in contemplating with sir thomas brown the happiness of inferior creatures who in tranquillity possess their constitutions but freedom from care and from the apprehension that is worse than care does not necessarily imply freedom from all disagreeable sensations and the surest claim of the brute to satisfaction its absolute adequacy to the place it is designed to fill is destroyed by our interference in its behalf as a result domestic pets reveal plainly to every close observer how frequently they suffer from ennui they pay in smaller coin the same price that man pays for comfortable living mr ruskin has written with ready sympathy of the house-dog who bears resignedly long hours of dull inaction and only shows by his frantic delight what a relief it is to be taken out for the mild dissipation of a stroll i have myself watched and pitied the too evident ennui of my cat poor little beast of prey deprived in a mouseless home of the supreme pleasures of the hunt fed until dinner ceases to be a coveted enjoyment housed cushioned combed caressed and forced to bear upon her pretty shoulders the burden of a wearisome opulence or what represents opulence to a pussy i have seen agrippina listlessly moving from chair to chair and from sofa to sofa in a vain attempt to nap looking for a few languid minutes out of the window with the air of a great lady sadly bored at the play and then turning dejectedly back into the room whose attractions she had long since exhausted her expressive eyes lifted to mine betrayed her discontent the lassitude of an irksome luxury unnerved her graceful limbs 
if she could have spoken it would have been to complain with charles lamb of that dumb soporifical good-for-nothingness which clogs the wheels of life it is a pleasant fancy baseless and proofless which makes us imagine the existence of fishes to be peculiarly tranquil and unmolested the element in which they live appears to shelter them from so many evils noises especially and the sharpness of sudden change scorching heats and the inclement skies of winter a delightful mystery wraps them round and the smooth apathy with which they glide through the water suggests content approaching to complacency that old-fashioned poem beginning deep in the wave is a coral grove where the purple mullet and goldfish rove filled my childish heart with a profound envy of these happy creatures which was greatly increased by reading a curious story of father faber's called the melancholy heart in this tale a little shipwrecked girl is carried to the depths of the ocean and sees the green sea swinging to and fro because it is so full of joy and the fishes waving their glistening fins in silent satisfaction and the oysters opening and shutting their shells in lazy raptures of delight afterwards she visits the birds and beasts and insects and finds amongst them intelligence industry patience ingenuity a whole host of admirable qualities but nowhere else the sweet contentment of that dumb watery life so universal is this fallible sentiment that even leopardi while assigning to all creative things their full share of pain reluctantly admits that the passive serenity of the less vivacious creatures of the sea starfish and their numerous brothers and sisters is the nearest possible approach to an utterly impossible happiness and indeed it is difficult to look at a sea urchin slowly moving its countless spines in the clear shallow water without thinking that here at least is an existence equally free from excitability and from ennui here is a state of being sufficient for itself and embracing all the enjoyment it can hold the other side of the story is presented when we discover the little prickly cup lying empty and dry on the peak of a neighboring rock and know that a crow's sharp beak has relentlessly dug the poor urchin from its comfortable cradle and ended its slumberous felicity yet the sudden cessation of life has nothing whatever to do with its reasonable contentment the question is not how soon is it over or how does it come to an end but is it worth living while it lasts moreover the chances of death make the sweetness of self-preservation and this is precisely the sentiment which lee hunt has so admirably embodied in those lines the finest i think he ever wrote where the fish pleads for its own pleasant and satisfactory existence a cold sweet silver life wrapped in round waves quickened with touches of transporting fear here as elsewhere fear is the best antidote for ennui the early settlers of america surrounded by hostile indians and doubtful each morning whether the coming nightfall would not see their rude homes given to the flames probably suffered but little from the dullness which seems so oppressive to the peaceful agriculturalist of to-day the medieval women who were content to pass their time in weaving endless tapestries had less chance to complain of the monotony of life than their artistic scientific literary and philanthropic sisters of our day for at any hour breaking in upon their tranquil labors might be heard the trumpet's blast at any hour might come the tidings good or bad which meant a few more years of security or the horrors of siege and pillage it is pleasant to turn our consideration from the ennui which is inevitable and consequently tragic to the ennui which is accidental and consequently diverting the first is part of ourselves from which there is no escape the second is as a rule the contribution of our neighbors and may be excluded if fortune and our own wits favor us lord byron for example finding himself hard beset by madame de stal whom he abhorred had the dexterity to entrap poor little monk lewis into their conversation and then slipped away from both 
leaving them the dismally congenial task of wearying each other without mercy a bore says bishop selwyn is a man who will persist in talking about himself when you want to talk about yourself and this simple explanation offers a satisfactory solution of much of the ennui suffered in society people with theories of life are perhaps the most relentless of their kind for no time or place is sacred from their devastating elucidations a theoretic socialist not the practical working kind like sir walter is adamant to the fatigue of his listeners eloquence says mr lowell feelingly has no bowels for its victims and one of the most pathetic figures in the history of literature is poor heine awakened from his sweet morning nap by ludwig borne who sat relentlessly on the edge of the bed and talked patriotism i hardly think that even this wanton injury justified heine in his cruel attack upon borne when the latter was dead and could offer no defence yet who knows how many drops of concentrated bitterness were stored up in those dreary moments of boredom the only other instance of ennui which seems as grievous and as cruel is the picture of the baron fouquet's brilliant wife condemned to play lotto every evening with the officers of the victorious french army an illustration equally novel and malign of the devastating inhumanity of war in fact amusements which do not amuse are among the most depressing of earthly evils when sir george cornwall lewis candidly confessed that life would be tolerable were it not for its pleasures he had a little notion that he was uttering a witticism fated to enjoy a melancholy immortality his protest was purely personal and society prompt to recognize a grievance when it is presented has gone on ever since peevishly and monotonously echoing his lament we crave diversion so eagerly we need it so sorely that our disappointment in its elusiveness is fed by the flickerings of perpetual hope ennui has been defined as a desire for activity without the capacity for action as a state of inertia quickened by discontent but it is rather a desire for amusement than for activity it is a rational instinct warped by the irony of circumstances and by our own selfish limitations it was not activity that schopenhauer lacked he worked hard all his life and with the concentrated industry of a man who knew exactly what he wanted to do it was the common need of enjoyment which he shared with the rest of mankind and his own singular incapacity for enjoying himself which chafed him into bitterness and made him so unreasonably angry with the world in human existence says leopardi the intervals between pleasure and pain are occupied by ennui and since all pleasures are like cobwebs exceedingly fragile thin and transparent ennui penetrates their tissue and saturates them just as air penetrates the webs it is indeed nothing but a yearning for happiness without the illusion of pleasure or the reality of pain this yearning is never satisfied since true happiness does not exist so that life is interwoven with weariness and suffering and one of these evils disappears only to give place to the other such is the destiny of man now to endure pain resolutely courage is required to endure ennui one must be bred to the task the restraints of a purely artificial society are sufferable to those only whom custom has rendered docile and who have been trained to subordinate their own impulses and desires the more elaborate the social conditions the more relentless this need of adjustment which makes a harmonious whole at the cost of individual development we all know how when poor francis burney was lifted suddenly from the cheerful freedom of the middle-class life to the wearisome etiquette of a court she drooped and fretted under the burden of an honour which brought her nothing but vexation macaulay who champions her cause with burning zeal is pleased to represent the monotony of court as simple slavery with no extenuating circumstances 
he likens dr burney conducting his daughter to the palace to a circassian father selling his own child into bondage the sight of the authoress of evelina assisting at the queen's toilet or chatting sleepily with the ladies-in-waiting thrills him with indignation the thought of her playing cards night after night with madame schwellenberg reduces him to despair and indeed card-playing if you have not the grace to like it is the most unprofitable form of social martyrdom you suffer horribly yourself and you add very little to the pleasure of your neighbour the baroness Fouquet may have conquered the infantine imbecilities of lotto with no great mental exhaustion if she were painfully bored her patience alone was taxed the frenchman probably thought her a pleased and animated companion but miss burney delicate sleepy fatigued loathing cards and inwardly rebellious at her fate must have made the game drag sadly before bedtime it was a dreary waste of moments for her but a less intolerant partisan than macaulay would have had some sympathy to spare for poor madame schwellenberg who like most women of rank adored the popular pastime and who doubtless found the distinguished young novelist a very unsatisfactory associate it is salutary to turn from miss burney and her wrathful historian to the letters of charlotte elizabeth mother of the regent d'orleans and see how the oppressive monotony of the french court was cheerfully endured for fifty years by a woman exiled from home and kindred whose pleasures were few whose annoyances were manifold madame would have enjoyed nothing better than a bowl of beer soup or a dish of sausages eaten in congenial company she lunched daily alone on hated french messes stared at by twenty footmen from whose supercilious eyes she was glad to escape with hunger still unsatisfied madame detested sermons she listened to them endlessly without complaint and was grateful for the occasional privilege of a nap madame liked cards she was not permitted to play nor even to show herself at the lasconette table she never gambled in fact she had no money and it was a fancy of her husband's that she brought him ill luck by hovering near neither was she allowed to retire all the old women who do not play have to be entertained by me she writes with surpassing good humour this goes on from seven to ten and makes me yawn frightfully supper was eaten at the royal table where the guests often waited three-quarters of an hour for the king to appear and where nobody spoke a word during the meal i live as though i were quite alone in the world confesses this friendless exile to her favourite correspondent the rogravine louise but i am resigned to such a state of things and i meddle in nothing here was a woman trained to the endurance of ennui the theatre and the chase were her sole amusements letter-writing was her only occupation her healthy german nature had in it no trace of languor no bitterness born of useless rebellion against fate she knew how to accept the inevitable and how to enjoy the accidental and this double philosophy afforded her something closely resembling content napoleon it is said once desired some comedians to play at court and m de talleyrand gravely announced to the audience waiting to hear them gentlemen the emperor earnestly requests you to be amused had charlotte elizabeth long before laid to sleep in st denis been one of that patient group she would have literally obeyed the royal commands she would have responded with prompt docility to any offered entertainment this was not an easy task amuse me if you can find out how to do it was the melancholy direction of richelieu to bois robert when the pains of ennui grew unbearable and even kittens ceased to be diverting amuse 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 is the plea of a weariness as wide as the world and as old as humanity amuse me for a little while that i may think i have escaped from myself it is curious that england should have to borrow from france the word ennui while the french are unanimous in their opinion that the thing itself is emphatically of english growth the old rhyme jean rosbif et cuillet qui pendit soi-même pour ses dessinuiers 
has never lost its application though the present generation of english-speaking men are able to digest a great deal of dullness without seeking such violent forms of relief in fact mr oscar wilde prompt to offer an unwelcome criticism explains the amazing popularity of the psychological and religiously irreligious novel on the ground that the genre ennuyeux which no frenchman can bring himself to pardon is the one form of literature which his countrymen thoroughly enjoy they have a kindly tolerance for stupid people as well and the ill-natured term bore has only forced itself of late years upon an urbane and long-suffering public johnson's dictionary is innocent of the word though johnson himself was well acquainted with the article as late as eighteen twenty two a reviewer in colburn's magazine entreats his readers to use the word bore to write it if they please to print it even if necessary why shrink from the expression when the creature itself is so common and daily gaining ground in the country before this date however one english writer had given to literature some priceless illustrations of the species could we but study our boars as miss austen must have studied hers in her country village says mrs ritchie what a delightful world this might be but i seriously doubt whether any real enjoyment could be extracted from miss bates or mr rushworth or sir william lucas in the flesh if we knew them we should probably feel precisely as did emma wodehouse and maria bertram and elizabeth bennet vastly weary of their company in fact only their brief appearances make the two gentlemen bores so diverting even in fiction and miss bates i must confess taxes my patience sorely she is so tiresome that she tires and i am invariably tempted to do what her less fortunate townspeople would have gladly done run away from her to more congenial society surely comedy ceases and tragedy begins when poor jane fairfax escapes from the strawberry party at donwell and seeks under the burning noonday sun the blessed relief of solitude we all know at times what it is to be wearied in spirits mine i admit are exhausted is the confession wrung from the silent lips of a girl who has borne all that human nature can bear from miss bates's affectionate solitude perhaps the best word ever spoken upon the creation of such characters in novels comes from cardinal newman it is very difficult he says to delineate a bore in a narrative for the simple reason that he is a bore a tale must aim at condensation but a bore acts in solution it is only in the long run that he is ascertained and when he is ascertained in his identity established beyond reach of doubt what profit have we in his desolating perfections miss austen was far from enjoying the dull people whom she knew in life we have the testimony of her letters to this effect has not mrs stent otherwise lost to fame been crowned with direful immortality as the woman who bored jane austen we may come to be mrs stent's ourselves she writes with facile self-reproach at her impatience unequal to anything and unwelcome to anybody an apprehension manifestly manufactured out of nothingness to strengthen some wavering purpose of amendment stupidity is acknowledged to be the one natural gift which cannot be cultivated and miss austen well knew it lay beyond her grasp with as much sincerity could emma wodehouse have said i may come in time to be a second miss bates there is a small compact and enviable minority among us who through no merit of their own are incapable of being bored and consequently escape the endless pangs of ennui they are so clearly recognized as a body that a great deal of the world's work is prepared especially for their entertainment and instruction books are written for them sermons are preached to them lectures are given to them papers are read to them societies and clubs are organized for them discussions after the order of melchizedek are carried on monotonously in their behalf a brand new school of fiction has been invented for their exclusive diversion and several complicated systems of religion have been put together for their recent edification 
it is hardly a matter of surprise that fed on such meats they should wax scornful and deride their hungry fellow-creatures it is even less amazing that these fellow-creatures should weary from time to time of the crumbs that fall from their table it is told of pliny the younger that being invited to a dinner he consented to come on the express condition that the conversation should abound in socratic discourses here was a man equally insensible to ennui and to the sufferings of others the guests at that ill-starred banquet appear to have been sacrificed as ruthlessly as the fish and game they ate they had not even the loophole of escape which mr badgett contemplates so admiringly in paradise lost whenever adam's remarks expand too obviously into a sermon eve in the most discreet and wife-like manner steps softly away and refreshes herself with slumber indeed when we come to think of it conversations between these two must have been difficult at times because they had nobody to talk about if we exiled our neighbors permanently from our discussions we should soon be reduced to silence and if we confined ourselves even to laudatory remarks we should probably say but little miss frances power cobb who is uncompromisingly hostile to the feeble vices of society insists that it is the duty of every woman to look bored when she hears a piece of scandal but this mandate is hardly in accord with miss cobb's other requisite for true womanhood absolute and undeviating sincerity how can she look bored when she does not feel bored unless she plays the hypocrite and while many women are shocked and repelled by scandal few alas are wont to find it tiresome i have not even observed any exceeding weariness in men when subjected to a similar ordeal in that pitiless dialogue of landers between catherine of russia and princess dashkov we find some opinions on this subject stated with appalling candor believe me says the empress there is nothing so delightful in life as to find a liar in a person of repute have you never heard good folks rejoicing at it or rather can you mention to me any one who has not been in raptures when he could communicate such glad tidings the gaudiest man would go on foot to tell his friend of it at midnight and would cross the neva for the purpose when he doubted whether the ice would bear him here indeed is the very soul and essence of ennui not the virtuous sentiment which revolts at the disclosure of another's faults but that deep and deadly ennui of life which welcomes evil as a distraction the same selfish lassitude which made the gladiatorial combats a pleasant sight for the jaded eyes which witnessed them finds relief for its tediousness to-day in the swift destruction of confidence and reputation there is a curious and melancholy fable of leopardi's in which he seeks to explain what always puzzled him sorely the continued endurance of life in the beginning he says the gods gave to man an existence without care and an earth without evil the world was small and easily traversed no seas divided it no mountains rose frowning from its bosom no extremes of heat or cold afflicted its inhabitants their wants were supplied their pleasures provided their happiness jove thought assured for a time all things went well but as the human race outgrew its infancy it tired of this smooth perfection and little by little there dawned upon men the inherent worthlessness of life every day they sounded its depths more clearly and every day they wearied afresh of all they knew and were illusions vanished and the insupportable pains of ennui forced them to cast aside a gift in which they found no value they desired death and sought it at their own hands then jove half in wrath and half in pity devised a means by which his rebellious creatures might be preserved he enlarged the earth moulded the mountains and poured into mighty hollows the restless and pitiless seas burning heat and icy cold he sent diseases and dangers of every kind craving desires that could never be satisfied vain ambitions a babble of many tongues and the deep-rooted animosities of nations 
gone was the old tranquillity vanished the old ennui a new race struggling amid terrible hardships fought bravely and bitterly for the preservation of an existence they had formerly despised man found his life filled with toil sweetened by peril checked by manifold disasters and was deluded into cherishing at any cost that which was so painful to sustain the greater the difficulties and dangers the more he opposed to them his own indomitable purpose the more determined he was to live the zest of perpetual effort the keenness of contention the brief sweet triumph over adversity these left him neither the time nor the disposition to question the value of all that he had wrung from fate it is a cheerless philosophy but not without value to the sanguine socialist of to-day who dreams of preparing for all of us a lifetime of unbroken ennui end of section six section seven of essays in idleness by agnes replier this librivox recording is in the public domain wit and humor it is dubious wisdom to walk in the footprints of a giant and to stumble with little steps along the road where his great strides were taken yet many years have passed since hazlitt trod this way fresh flowers have grown by the root and fresh weeds have fought with them for mastery the face of the country has changed for better or for worse and a brief survey reveals much that never met his eyes the journey too was safer in his day than in ours and while he gathers and analyzes every species of wit and humor it plainly does not occur to him for a moment that either calls for any protection at his hands hazlitt is so sure that laughter is our inalienable right that he takes no pains to soften its cadences or to justify its mirth we laugh at that in others which is a serious matter to ourselves he says and sees no reason why this should not be some one is generally sure to be the sufferer by a joke and fortified with this assurance he confesses to a frank delight in the comic parts of the arabian nights although recognizing keenly the spirit of cruelty that underlies them and aware that they carry the principles of callous indifference in a jest as far as it can go don quixote too he stoutly affirms to be as fitting a subject for merriment as sancho panza both are laughable and both are meant to be laughed at the extravagances of each being pitted dexterously against those of the other by a great artist in the ridiculous but he is by no means insensible to the charm and goodness of the ingenious gentleman for sympathy is the legitimate attribute of humor and even where the humorist seems most pitiless and even brutal in his apprehension of the absurd he has a living tenderness for our poor humanity which is so rich in its absurdities hazlitt's definition of wit and humor is perhaps as good as any definition is ever likely to be that is it expresses a half-truth with a great deal of reasonableness and accuracy humor he says is the describing the ludicrous as it is in itself wit is the exposing it by comparing or contrasting it with something else humor is the growth of nature and accident wit is the product of art and fancy humor as it is shown in books is an imitation of the natural or acquired absurdities of mankind or of the ludicrous in accident situation and character wit is the illustrating and heightening the sense of that absurdity by some sudden and unexpected likeness or opposition of one thing to another which sets off the quality we laugh at or despise in a still more contemptible or striking point of view this is perhaps enough to show us at least one cause of the endless triumph of humor over wit a triumph due to its closer affinity with the simple and elementary conditions of human nature and life wit is artificial humor is natural wit is accidental humor is inevitable wit is born of conscious effort humor of the allotted ironies of fate wit can be expressed only in language humor can be developed sufficiently in situation 
wit is the placing of the intellectual or the weapon of nimble minds humor is the possession of all sorts and conditions of men wit is truly what shelley falsely imagined virtue to be a refinement of civilized life humor is the property of all races in every stage of development wit possesses a species of immortality and for many generations holds its own humor is truly immortal and as long as the eye sees and the ear hears and the heart beats it will be our privilege to laugh at the pleasant absurdities which require no other seed or nurture than man's endless intercourse with man nevertheless an understanding of the differences in nations and in epochs helps us to the enjoyment of many humorous situations we should know something of england and of india to appreciate the peculiar horror with which lord minto on reaching calcutta beheld the fourteen male attendants who stood in his chamber respectfully prepared to help him into bed or his still greater dismay at being presented by the rajah of bali with seven slaves five little boys and two little girls all of whom cost the conscientious governor-general a deal of trouble and expense before they were properly disposed of and in a fair way to learn their alphabet and catechism yet perhaps a deeper knowledge of time and character is needed to sound the depths of sir robert walpole's cynical observation gratitude is a lively sense of future favors although this is indeed a type of witticism which possesses inherent vitality not depending upon any play of words or double meanings but striking deep root into the fundamental failings of the human heart it is in its simplest forms however that humor enjoys a world-wide actuality and is the connecting link of all times and places and people let us start from laughter says m edmund shearer since laughter is a thing familiar to every one it is excited by a sense of the ridiculous and the ridiculous arises from the contradiction between the use of a thing and its intention even that commonest of all themes a fellow-creature slipping or falling m shearer holds to be provocative of mirth and in selecting this elementary example he bravely drives the matter back to its earliest and rudest principles for it is a weapon in the hands of the serious that such casualties which should excite instant sympathy and alarm awaken laughter only in those who are too foolish or too brutal to experience any other sensation it would seem indeed that the sight of a man falling on the ice or in the mud cannot be and ought not to be very amusing but before we frown severely and forever upon such vulgar jests let us turn for a moment to a well-known essay and see what charles lamb has to plead in their extenuation i am by nature extremely susceptible of street affronts the jeers and taunts of the populace the low-bred triumph they display over the casual trip or splashed stocking of a gentleman yet i can endure the jocularity of a young sweep with something more than forgiveness in the last winter but one pacing along cheapside with my accustomed precipitation when i walk westward a treacherous slide brought me upon my back in an instant i scrambled up with pain and shame enough yet outwardly trying to face it down as if nothing had happened when the roguish grin of one of these young wits encountered me there he stood pointing me out with his dusky finger to the mob and to a poor woman i suppose his mother in particular till the tears for the exquisiteness of the fun so he thought it worked themselves out at the corners of his poor red eyes red from many a previous weeping and soot inflamed yet twinkling through all with such a joy snatched out of desolation that hogarth but hogarth has got him already how could he miss him in the march to finchley grinning at the pieman there he stood as he stands in the picture irremovable as if the jest was to last for ever with such a maximum of glee and minimum of mischief in his mirth for the grin of a genuine sweep hath absolutely no malice in it that i could have been content if the honour of a gentleman might endure it to have remained his butt and his mockery till midnight ah prince of kindly humorists 
to whom shall we go but you for tears and laughter and pastime and sympathy and jests and gentle tolerance and all things needed to make light our trouble-burdened hearts it is not worth while to deny or even to soften the cruel side of humour though it is a far more grievous error to overlook its generous forbearance the humorist's view of life is essentially genial but he has given stout blows in his day and the sound of his vigorous warfare rings harshly in our unaccustomed ears the old giants of english fun were neither soft-spoken nor soft-handed gentry and it seems to us now and then as if they laid about them with joyous and indiscriminate activity even dickens the last and greatest of his race and haunted often to his fall by the beckoning of mirthless modern phantoms shows in his earlier work a good deal of this gleeful and unhesitating belligerency the scenes between old weller and mr stiggins might be successfully acted in a spirited puppet show where conversation is of less importance than well-timed and well-bestowed pommeling but we have now reached that point of humane seriousness when even puppet shows cannot escape their educational responsibilities and when punch and judy are gravely censured for teaching a lesson in brutality the laughter of generations which should protect and hallow the little mannequins at play counts for nothing by the side of their irresponsible naughtiness and their cheerful disregard of all our moral standards yet here too hazlitt has a seasonable word of defence holding indeed that he who invented such diverting pastimes was a benefactor to his species and gave us something which it was rational and healthy to enjoy we place the mirth and glee and triumph to our own account he says and we know that the bangs and blows the actors have received go for nothing as soon as the showman puts them up in his box and marches off quietly with them as jugglers of a less amusing description sometimes march off with the wrongs and rights of mankind in their pockets it has been well said that wit requires a good head humour a good heart and fun high spirits punch's spirits let us hasten to admit are considerably in advance of his head and heart yet nevertheless he is wanting neither in acuteness nor in the spirit of good fellowship he has hearkened to the advice given by seneca many years ago jest without bitterness and has practised this delightful accomplishment for centuries as befits the most conservative joker in the world another reproach urged against humour rather than wit is its somewhat complicated system of lying and much well-merited severity has been expended upon such questionable diversions as hoaxing quizzing selling and other variations of the game the titles of which have long since passed away leaving their substance behind them it would be easy but untrue to say that real humour has nothing whatever to do with these unworthy offshoots and never encourages their growth the fact remains that they spring from a great humorous principle and one which critics have been prompt to recognise and embody in language as clear and unmistakable as possible lying says hazlitt is a species of wit and humour to lay anything to a person's charge from which he is perfectly free shows spirit and invention and the more incredible the effrontery the greater is the joke the terrors of sancho observes m Scherer, the rascalities of scapin the brags of falstaff amuse us because of their disproportion with circumstances or their disagreement with facts just as charles lamb humanizes a brutal jest by turning it against himself so walter scott gives amusing emphasis to a lie by directing it against his own personality his description of himself in his journal as a pebble-hearted cur the occasion being his parting with the emotional madame mirbel is truly humorous because of its remoteness from the truth there are plenty of men who could have risked using the phrase without exciting in us that sudden sense of incongruity which is a legitimate source of laughter a delightful instance of effrontery which shows both spirit and invention is the story told by sir francis doyle of the highwaymen who having attacked and robbed lord derby and his friend mr grenville said to them with reproachful candour 
what scoundrels you must be to fire at gentlemen who risk their lives upon the road as for the wit that lies in playful misstatements and exaggerations we must search for it in the riotous humour of lamb's letters where the true and the false are often so inextricably commingled that it is a hopeless task to separate facts from fancies i shall certainly go to the naughty man for fibbing writes lamb with soft laughter and the devout apprehension may have been justly shared by edward fitzgerald when he describes the parish church at woodbridge as being so damp that the fungi grew in great numbers about the communion table a keen sense of the absurd is so little relished by those who have it not that it is too often considered solely as a weapon of offence and not as a shield against the countless ills that come to man through lack of sanity and judgment there is a well-defined impression in the world that the satirist like the devil roams abroad seeking whom he may devour and generally devouring the best whereas his position is often that of the besieged who defends himself with the sharpest weapons at his command against a host of invading evils there are many things in life so radically unwholesome that it is not safe to approach them save with laughter as a disinfectant and when people cannot laugh the moral atmosphere grows stagnant and nothing is too morbid too preposterous or too mischievous to meet with sympathy and solemn assurances of good will this is why a sense of the ridiculous has been justly called the guardian of our minor morals rendering men in some measure dependent upon the judgments of their associates and laying the basis of that decorum and propriety of conduct which is a necessary condition of human life and upon which is founded the great charm of intercourse between equals from what pitfalls of vanity and self-assurance have we been saved by this ever watchful presence into what abysmal follies have we fallen when she withholds her restraining hand shelley's letters are perhaps the strongest argument in behalf of healthy humour that literature has yet offered to the world only a man burdened with an invincible repugnance to the comic could have gravely penned a sentence like this certainly a saint may be amiable she may be so but then she does not understand has neglected to investigate the religion which retiring modest prejudice leads her to profess only a man afflicted with what mr arnold mildly calls an inhuman lack of humour could have written thus to a female friend the french language you already know and if the great name of rousseau did not redeem it it would have been perhaps as well that you had remained ignorant of it our natural pleasure at this verdict may be agreeably heightened by placing alongside of it madame de stal's moderate statement conversation like talent exists only in france and such robust expressions of opinion give us our clearest insight into at least one of the dangers from which a sense of the ridiculous rescues its fortunate possessor when all has been said however we must admit that edged tools are dangerous things to handle and not infrequently do much hurt the art of being humorous in an agreeable way is as difficult in our day as in the days of marcus aurelius and a disagreeable exercise of this noble gift is as unwelcome now as then levity has as many tricks as the kitten says lee hunt who was quite capable of illustrating and proving the truth of his assertion and whose scratching at times closely resembled the less playful manifestations of a full-grown cat wit is the salt of conversation not the food and few things in the world are more wearying than a sarcastic attitude towards life je goûte ceux qui sont raisonnables et me divertis des extravagants says urani in la critique de l'école des femmes and even these words seem to tolerant ears to savour unduly of arrogance the best use we can make of humour is not to divert ourselves with but to defend ourselves against the folly of fools for much of the world's misery is entailed upon her by her eminently well-meaning and foolish children there is no finer proof of miss austen's mature genius than the gradual mellowing of her humour 
from the deliberate pleasure affected by elizabeth bennet and her father in the foibles of their fellow-creatures to the amused sympathy betrayed in every page of emma and persuasion not even the charm and brilliance of pride and prejudice can altogether reconcile us to a heroine who like uranie diverts herself with the failings of mankind what a gap between mr bennet's cynical praise of his son-in-law wickham which under the circumstances is a little revolting and mr knightley's manly reproof to emma whose youthful gaiety beguiles her into an unkind jest while we talk much of miss austen's merciless laughter let us remember always that the finest and bravest defence of harmless folly against insolent wit is embodied in this earnest remonstrance from the lips of a lover who is courageous enough to speak plain truths with no suspicion of priggishness to mar their wholesome flavor it is difficult at any time to deprive wit of its social or political surroundings it is impossible to drive it back to those deeper simpler sources whence humor springs unveiled hudibras for example is witty don quixote is humorous sheridan is witty goldsmith is humorous to turn from the sparkling scenes where the rivals play their mimic parts to the quiet fireside where the vicar and farmer flamborough sit sipping their gooseberry wine is to re-enter life and to feel human hearts beating against our own how delicate the touch which puts everything before us with a certain gentle loving malice winning us to laughter without for a moment alienating our sympathies from the right hazlitt claims for the wicked and witty comedies of the restoration that it is their privilege to allay our scruples and banish our just regrets but when goldsmith brings the profligate squire and his female associates into the vicar's innocent household the scene is one of pure and incomparable humour which nevertheless leaves us more than ever in love with the simple goodness which is so readily deceived mr thornhill utters a questionable sentiment the two fine ladies who have been striving hard to play their parts and only letting slip occasional oaths affect great displeasure at his laxness and at once begin a very discreet and serious dialogue upon virtue in this my wife the chaplain and i soon joined and the squire himself was at last brought to confess a sense of sorrow for his former excesses we talked of the pleasures of temperance and of the sunshine of the mind unpolluted with guilt i was so well pleased that my little ones were kept up beyond the usual time to be edited by so much good conversation mr thornhill even went beyond me and demanded if i had any objection to giving prayers i joyfully embraced the proposal and in this manner the night was passed in a most comfortable way till at length the company began to think of returning what a picture it is what an admirably humorous situation what easy tolerance in the treatment we laugh but even in our laughter we know that not for the space of a passing breath does goldsmith yield his own sympathy or divert ours away from the just cause of innocence and truth if men of real wit have been more numerous in the world than men of real humor it is because discernment and lenity mirth and conciliation are qualities which do not blend easily with the natural asperity of our race humor has been somewhat daringly defined as a sympathy for the seamy side of things it does not hover on the borders of the light and trifling it does not linger in that keen and courtly atmosphere which is the chosen playground of wit but diffusing itself subtly through all nature reveals to us life life which we love to consider and to judge from some pet standpoint of our own but which is so big and wonderful and good and bad and fine and terrible that our little peaks of observation command only a glimpse of the mysteries we are so ready and willing to solve thus the degree of wit embodied in an old story is a matter of much dispute and of scant importance but when we read that queen elizabeth in her last illness turned wearily away from matters of state yet delighted to hear some of the hundred merry tales and to such was very attentive we feel we have been lifted into the regions of humour 
and by its sudden light we recognize not the dubious merriment of the tales but the sick and world-worn spirit seeking a transient relief from fretful care and poisonous recollections so too when sheridan said of mr dundas that he resorted to his memory for his jests and to his imagination for his facts the great wit after the fashion of wits expressed a limited truth it was a delightful statement so far as it went but it went no further than mr dundas with just the possibility of a second application when voltaire sighed nothing is so disagreeable as to be obscurely hanged he gave utterance to a national sentiment which is not in the least witty but profoundly humorous revealing with charming distinctness a frenchman's innate aversion to all dull and commonplace surroundings dying is not with him as with an englishman a strictly private affair it is the last act of life's brilliant play which is expected to throw no discredit upon the sparkling scenes it closes the breath of atmosphere which humor requires for its development the saneness anti-sympathy of its revelations are admirably described by one of the most penetrating and least humorous of french critics m edmund shearer whose words are all the more grateful and valuable to us when they refer not to his own countrymen but to those robust english humorists whom it is our present pleasure to ignore m shearer it is true finds much fault and reasonable fault ever with these stout-hearted strong-handed veterans they are not always decorous they are not always sincere they are wont to play with their subjects they are too eager to amuse themselves and other people it is easy to make out a list of their derelictions yet this does not permit the temperament of the humorist from being on the whole the happiest that a man can bring with him into this world nor his point of view from being the fairest from which the world can be judged the satirist grows wroth the cynic banters the humorist laughs and sympathizes by turns he has neither the fault of the pessimist who refers everything to a purely personal conception and is angry with reality for not being such as he conceives it nor that of the optimist who shuts his eyes to everything missing on the real earth that he may comply with the demands of his heart and of his reason the humorist feels the imperfections of reality and resigns himself to them with good temper knowing that his own satisfaction is not the rule of things and that the formula of the universe is necessarily larger than the preferences of a single one of the accidental beings of whom the universe is composed he is beyond doubt the true philosopher this is a broad statement yet to endure life smilingly is no ignoble task and if the humours of mankind are inseparably blended with all their impulses and actions it is worth while to consider bravely the value of qualities so subtle and far-reaching in their influences steele as we know dressed the invading bailiffs in liveries and amazed his guests by the number and elegance of his retainers sidney smith fastened antlers on his sheep for the gratification of a lady who thought he ought to have deer in his park such elaborate jests born of invincible gaiety and high spirits seem childish to our present adult seriousness and we are too impatient to understand that they represent an attitude and a very healthy attitude towards life the iniquity of steele's career lay in his repeatedly running into debt not in the admirable temper with which he met the consequences of that debt when they were forced upon him and if the censorious are disposed to believe that a less happy disposition would have avoided these consequences let them consider the careers of poor richard savage and other misanthropic prodigals as for sidney smith he followed burton's excellent counsel go on then merrily to heaven and his path was none the less straight because it was smoothed by laughter that which must be borne had best be borne cheerfully and sometimes a single telling stroke of wit a single word rich in manly humour reveals to us that true courage that fine philosophy which endures and even tolerates the vicissitudes of fortune without for a moment relinquishing its honest hold upon the right 
mr lang has told us such a little story of the verger in a saxon town who was wont to show visitors a silver mouse which had been offered by the women to the blessed virgin that she might rid the town of mice a prussian officer with that prompt brutality which loves to offend religious sentiment it does not share asked jeeringly are you such fools as to believe that the creatures went away because a silver mouse was dedicated ah no replied the verger or long ago we should have offered a silver prussian it is the often expressed opinion of lee hunt that although wit and humour may be found in perfection apart from each other yet their best work is shared in common wit separated from humour is but an element of sport a laughing jade with petulant whims and fancies which runs away with our discretion confuses our wisdom and mocks at holy charity yet adds greatly withal to the buoyancy and popularity of life it makes gentlefolk laugh a difficult task says moliere it scatters our faculties and bears them off deridingly into pastime it is a fire gleam in our dull world a gift of the gods who love to provide weapons for the amusement and discomfiture of mankind but humour stands on common soil and breathes our common air the kindly contagion of its mirth lifts our hearts from their personal apprehension of life's grievances and links us together in a bond of mutual tears and laughter if it be powerless to mould existence or even explain it to our satisfaction it can give us at least some basis for philosophy some scope for sympathy and sanity and endurance the perceptions of the contrasts of human destiny says m Schurer, by a man who does not sever himself from humanity but who takes his own shortcomings and those of his dear fellow-creatures cheerfully this is the essence of humour end of section seven section eight of essays in idleness by agnes replier the sleepervox recording is in the public domain letters it is one of the current complaints of to-day that the art of letter-writing as our great-grandfathers and our great-great-grandfathers knew it has been utterly and irrevocably lost railways which bring together easily and often people who used to spend the greater portions of their lives apart cheap postage which relieves a man from any serious responsibility for what he writes the most insignificant scrawl seems worth the stamp he puts on it the hurried restless pace at which we live each day filled to the brim with things which are hardly so important as we think them and which have cost us the old rich hours of leisurely thought and inaction these are the forces which have conspired to destroy the letter and to crowd into its place that usurping and unprofitable little upstart called the note the art of note-writing says mr badgett may become classical it is for the present age to provide models for that sort of composition but letters have perished in the last century cultivated people who sat down to write took pains to have something to say and took pains to say it the correspondence of to-day is like a series of telegrams with amplified headings there is not more than one idea and that idea soon comes and is soon over the best correspondence of the past is rather like a good light article in which the points are studiously made in which the effort to make them is studiously concealed in which a series of selected circumstances is set forth in which you feel but are not told that the principle of the writer's selection was to make his composition pleasant it is difficult not to agree with mr badgett and other critics who have uttered similar lamentations the letter which resembled a good light article has indeed disappeared from our midst and i am not sure that many dry eyes have not witnessed its departure light articles are now provided for us in such generous measure by our magazines that we have scant need to exact them from our friends in fact we should have no time to read them if they were written a more serious loss is the total absence of any minute information or gossip upon current topics in the mass of modern correspondence 
the letter which is so useful to historians which shows us and shows us as nothing else can ever do the ordinary everyday life of prominent men and women this letter has also disappeared and there is nothing to take its place we can reconstruct the england or at least the london of george the second and george the third from the pages of horace walpole who is there likely to hand down in this fashion to a coming generation the england of queen victoria neither does the fact of walpole's being by no means a bigot in the matter of truth-telling interfere with his real value he lies consciously and with a set purpose here and there he is unconsciously and even inevitably voracious in the main there are some points observes mr badgett on which almost everybody's letters are true the delineation of a recurring and familiar life is beyond the reach of a fraudulent fancy horace walpole was not a very scrupulous narrator yet it was too much trouble even for him to tell lies on many things his stories and conspicuous scandals are no doubt often unfounded but there is a gentle undercurrent of daily unremarkable life and manners which he evidently assumed as a datum for his historical imagination we may be quite sure for example on his testimony that people of fashion went to ranelagh two hours after the music was over because it was thought vulgar to go earlier that lord darby's cook gave him warning rather than dress suppers at three o'clock in the morning that when a masked ball was given by eighteen young noblemen at soho the mob in the street stopped the fine coaches held up torches to the windows and demanded to have the masks pulled off and put on at their pleasure but all with extreme good humour and civility that he horace walpole one night at vauxhall helped lady caroline petersham to mince seven chickens in a china dish which chickens lady caroline stewed over a lamp with three pats of butter in a flagon of water stirring and rattling and laughing and we every minute expecting to have the dish fly about our ears that at the funeral of george the second the duke of newcastle that curious burlesque of an english nobleman stood on the train of the butchered duke of cumberland to avoid the chill of the marble if we think these things are not worth knowing we had better not read walpole's letters for these are the things which he delights in telling us macaulay thought these things not worth knowing and he has accordingly branded walpole as a superficial observer a vain and shallow worldling how he wonders can we seriously listen to a man who haunted auctions who collected bric-a-brac who sat up all night playing cards with fine frivolous ladies who liked being a fashionable gentleman and had no proper pride in belonging to the august assemblage of authors and who most deadly crime of all lived face to face with the great whig leaders of the day and was not in the least impressed by the magnitude of the distinction thus conferred on him but after all we cannot every one of us be built upon the same solemn and righteous lines it is not even granted to every one to be a fervent and consistent whig horace walpole you see was horace walpole and not thomas babington macaulay therefore macaulay despised him and called on all his readers to despise him too we can only have recourse to mr lang's philosophy tis a wide world my masters there is room for both walpole is the prince of letter-writers because writing letters was the inspiration the ruling passion of his life and he was pre-eminently qualified for the task it has been well said that had some evil chance wrecked him like robinson crusoe upon a desert island he would have gone on writing letters just the same and waited for a ship to carry them away this is a pleasant conceit because the spectacle of horace walpole on a desert island is one which captivates the idle fancy think of his little airs and graces his courtly affectations his fine clothes and frippery his daily epicureanism his sense of good comradeship all thrown away upon a desert island and upon the society of a parrot and a goat what malicious tales he would have been forced to invent about the parrot 
it is best not to believe evil of any one upon walpole's word especially not of any one who had ever attacked sir robert's ministry for horace's filial piety took the very exclusive form of undying enmity to all his father's political opponents but when we have passed over and tried to forget all that is spiteful and caustic and coarse in these celebrated letters there is a great deal left a great deal that is not even the current gossip of the day he goes to paris in seventeen sixty five and finds that laughing is out of fashion in that once gay capital good folks he cries they have no time to laugh there are god and the king to be pulled down first and men and women one and all are devoutly employed in the demolition they think me quite profane for having my belief left a few years later walpole sees clearly that french politics must end in despotism a civil war or assassination the age is not he says as he once thought an age of abortion but rather an age of seeds which are to produce strange crops hereafter surely even macaulay might allow that these are the words of a thinker of a prophet perhaps standing unheeded in the market-place granted then that the light article letter and the letter which gives us material with which to fill up the gaps and crannies of history which holds the life of the past embalmed in its faded pages have disappeared perhaps for ever there is another letter which has not disappeared which can never disappear as long as man stays man and woman woman the letter which reveals to us the personality of the writer which is dear and valuable to us because in it his hand stretches out frankly from the past and draws us to his side it may be long or short carefully or carelessly written full of useful information or full of idle nonsense we do not stop to ask it is enough for us to know from whom it came and the finest type of such a letter may surely be found in the well-loved correspondence of charles lamb if we eliminated from his pages all critical matter all those shrewd and admirable verdicts upon prose and verse if we cut out ruthlessly such scraps of news as they occasionally convey if we banished all references to celebrated people from the obnoxious squeak of shelley's voice to the generous sympathy expressed for napoleon we should still have left the writer himself which is all that we desire we should still have the record of that harmless and patient that brave and sorely tried life we should still see infinite mirth and infinite pathos interwoven upon every page we should catch the echo of that clear kind laughter which never hardens into scorn lamb laughs at so many people and never once wrongs any one we should see the flashes of a wit which carries no venom in its sting we should feel that atmosphere of wonderful whimsical humour illuminating all the trivial details of existence we should recognise in the turning of every sentence the conscious choice of every word the fine and distinctive qualities of a genius that has no parallel it matters little what page we read here is the sad story of henry robinson's waistcoat which mary lamb tried to bring over from france but which was seized at the custom house for the use of the king says charles dryly he will probably appear in it at the next levy here is the never-to-be-forgotten tea-party at miss benjay's where that tenth-rate little upstart of a woman type of a genus that survives to-day alternately patronized and snubbed her guest flinging at him her pitiful scraps of information marvelling that he did not understand french insulting him when he ventured an opinion upon poetry seeing that it was my own trade in a manner imparting to him hannah moore's valuable dogmas on education feeding him scantily with macaroons and sending him home not angry as he had a right to be as any other man would have been in his place only infinitely amused and then some people say that a keen sense of the ridiculous is not a kindly sentiment it is we know it is when we read the letter to coleridge in which lamb tells how he went to condole with poor joseph cottle on the death of his brother amos 
and how as the readiest comfort he could offer he swiftly introduced into his conversation joseph's epic poem alfred luring the mourner gently from his grief by arousing his poetic vanity the dear good stupid coddle brightening visibly under such soothing treatment fixed upon his visitor a benevolent gaze and prepared himself for melancholy enjoyment after a while the name of alswitha alfred's queen was slipped adroitly into the discourse at that moment says lamb i could perceive that coddle had forgot his brother was so lately become a blessed spirit in the language of mathematicians the author was as nine the brother as one i felt my cue and strong pity stirring at the root i went to work so the little comedy proceeds until it reaches its climax when george dyer to whom all poems were good poems remarks that the dead amos was estimable both for his head and heart and would have made a fine poet if he had lived to this says lamb joseph fully assented but could not help adding that he always thought the qualities of his brother's heart exceeded those of his head i believe his brother when living had formed precisely the same idea of him and i apprehend the world will assent to both judgments now if we will but try to picture to ourselves how carlyle would have behaved to poor miss ben jay how walpole would have sneered at joseph coddle we will understand better the harmless the almost loving nature of charles lamb's raillery which we can enjoy so frankly because it gave no pain as for the well-known fact that lamb's letters reflect nothing of the political tumult the stirring warfare amid which he lived it is interesting to place by their side the contemporary letters of sir gilbert elliot the first earl of minto a correspondence the principal charm of which is the revelation it makes of a nature so fine and brave so upright and honourable so wise and strong and good that we can best understand the secret of england's greatness when we know she has given birth to such sons to study the life of a man who played so prominent a part in home and foreign politics is to study the history of europe during those troubled years in lord minto's letters we follow breathlessly the desperate struggle with napoleon the ceaseless wrangling of the allies the dangerous rebellions in ireland the grave perplexities of the indian empire and besides these all-important topics we have sidelights thrown upon social life we learn for instance that mrs crewe the celebrated beauty and toast of the whigs liked good conversation and took an interest and even a part writes sir gilbert naively to his wife in all subjects which men would naturally talk of when not in woman's company as politics and literature we learn also what we half suspected before that madame de stal was so greedy of admiration that she was capable of purchasing any quantity of anybody at any price and among other prices by a traffic of mutual flattery and that she was never satisfied unless she could have the whole conversation to herself and be the centre of every company now it is hardly to be expected that the letters of a great statesman and the letters of an obscure clerk in the india house should reveal precisely the same interests and information any more than it is to be expected that the letters of the statesman who was after all a statesman and no more should equal in literary charm and merit the letters of the clerk who was in addition an immortal genius but when we think how profoundly england was shaken and disturbed by the discords and apprehensions of those troubled times how wars and the rumours of wars darkened the air and stirred the blood of country bumpkins and placid rural squires it seems a little strange that lamb who lived long years in the heart of london and must have heard so much of these things should have written about them so little he does learn when there is a change of ministry because he hears a butcher say something about it in the market-place he cultivates a frank admiration for napoleon whom all his countrymen hated and feared so madly he would be glad he says to stand bareheaded at his table doing honour to him in his fall and after the battle of trafalgar he writes to hazlitt lord nelson is quiet at last 
his ghost only keeps a slight fluttering in odes and elegies in newspapers and impromptus which could not be got ready before the funeral these characteristic passages and others like them are all we hear of public matters from charles lamb and few of us would ask for more it is the continual sounding of the personal note that makes his pages so dear to us it is the peculiarly restful character of his beloved chit-chat that keeps them so fresh and delightful and while there is but one lamb there are many letters which have in them something of this same personal quality something of this restful charm the supply can never be exhausted because letter-writing not light articles now nor brilliant semi-historic narratives but real letter-writing is founded on a need as old and as young as humanity itself the need that one human being has of another the craving for sympathy the natural and healthy egotism which prompts us to open our minds to absent friends the desire we all feel to make known to others that which is happening to ourselves the certainty we all feel that others will be profoundly interested in this revelation the inextinguishable impulse to pass on experiences either of soul or body to share with someone else that which we are hearing or seeing or feeling or suffering or enjoying these are the motives which make letter-writing essential and inevitable crowd it into the busiest lives assimilate it with the dullest understandings and fit it into some crevice of everyone's daily experience thus it happens that there is a strong family resemblance between letters of every age and every country they really change less than we are pleased to think the rev augustus jessop in one of his delightful essays quotes from a long and chatty letter written about the time that moses was a little lad by an egyptian gentleman named pambessa to a friend named amenemapt and giving a very lively and minute account of the city of Ramses, which Pambessa was then happily visiting for the first time. We have, all of us, had just such letters from our absent friends, and have read them with mingled pleasure and envy and irritation. Pambessa, the traveller, is not disposed to spare Amenemapt, the stay-at-home, any detail of what he is missing. Never was there such a city of the gods as this particular town of Ramses, which Amenemapt was not destined to see. There might be found the best of good living, vines and fig trees and onion beds and nursery gardens. Stout drinkers, too, were its jovial inhabitants, with a variety of strong liquors, sweet syrups richer than honey, red wine, and very excellent imported beer its women were all well dressed and curled their hair enticingly smoothing it with sweet oil they stood at their doors holding nosegays in their hands and presenting a very alluring appearance to this gay and shameless pambessa who could hardly make up his mind to pass them coldly by altogether ramses was an exceedingly pleasant town to visit and the egyptian gentleman was having a very jolly time of it and we reading his correspondence fall to thinking that human nature before the exodus was uncommonly like human nature today. This is one of the delights of letter-reading, that it reveals to us not only the life of the past, but better still, the people of the past, our brothers and sisters who, being dead, still live in their written pages. For the scholar the interest lies in what Pambessa has to tell. For the rest of us the interest lies in Pambessa himself, who so many thousand years ago drank the bitter beer and stared at the pretty girls standing curled and flower-bedecked with those demure faint smiles which centuries cannot alter or impair so it continues as we run swiftly down the years the bulk of correspondence increasing enormously at every stage until we reach such monuments of industry as the famous cecil letters preserved at hatfield and comprising over thirty thousand documents it is pleasant to feel that we need read none of these and that if we search for character we may find it in thirty words as well as in thirty thousand rolls of musty parchment we may find it surely in that historic note dispatched by anne countess of dorset to sir joseph williamson secretary of state under charles the second 
who wanted her to appoint a courtier as member from Appleby. Nothing could well be shorter. Nothing could possibly be more significant. This is all. Sir, I have been bullied by an usurper. I have been ill-treated by a court. But I won't be dictated to by a subject. Your man shall not stand. Anne Dorset, Pembroke and Montgomery. Now, if you don't feel you know Anne Dorset pretty well after reading those four lines, you wouldn't know her if she left a diary as long as Samuel Pepys. And if you don't feel after reading them that she is worth the knowing, it is hopeless for her to try and win your regard. Another and still more amusing instance of self-revelation may be found in a manuscript familiar to many who have visited the Bodleian Library at Oxford. There, among other precious treasures, is a collection of notes scribbled by Charles the Second to Clarendon, and by Clarendon to Charles the Second, to beguile the tedium of counsel. They look, for all the world, like the notes which schoolgirls are wont to scribble to one another, to beguile the tedium of study. On one page, Charles, in a little careless hand, not unlike a schoolgirl's, writes that he wants to go to Tunbridge to see his sister. Clarendon, in larger, firmer characters, writes back that there is no reason why he should not, if he can return in a few days, and adds tentatively, I suppose you will go with a light train. Charles, as though glowing with conscious rectitude, responds, I intend to take nothing but my night bag. Clarendon, who knows his master's luxurious habits, is startled out of all propriety. Gods, he writes, you will not go without forty or fifty horse. Then Charles, who seems to have been waiting for this point in the dialogue, tranquilly replies in one straggling line at the bottom of the page, I count that part of my night bag. How plainly we can hear the royal chuckle which accompanied this gracious explanation. How really valuable is this scrap of correspondence which shows us, for a moment, Charles Stuart, not the Charles of Sir Walter's loyal stories, nor the Charles of Macaulay's eloquent invectives, but Charles himself, our fellow mortal, and a very human character indeed. If, as Mr. Badgett affirms, it is for the present day to provide models which shall make the art of note-writing classical, we can begin no better than by studying the specimens already in our keeping. If we want humor, pathos, a whole tale told in half a dozen words, we have these things already, in every sentence of Steele's hasty scrawls to his wife. Prue, Prue, look a little dressed and be beautiful. And again, "'Tis the glory of a woman, Prue, to be her husband's friend and companion, and not his sovereign director. Or, good nature, added to that beautiful form God has given you, would make an happiness too great for human life. And finally, I am, dear Prue, a little in drink, but at all times your faithful husband, Richard Steele. These bare scraps of letters— briefer, many of them, than the scandalous half-sheets which Prue was wont to send in return, give us a tolerably clear insight into the precise nature of Steele's domestic happiness. We understand not only the writer, but the recipient of such missives, poor, petulant Prue, who has had scant mercy shown her in Thackeray's brilliant pages, but whose own life was not passed upon a bed of roses." We are eager to catch these swift glimpses of real people through a few careless lines which have miraculously escaped destruction, or perhaps through a brief aside in an important, but to us, very uninteresting communication, as, for example, when Marlborough reopens a dispatch to say he has just received word of the surprise and defeat of the Dutch general Opdam. Since I sealed my letter, he writes with characteristic dryness, we have a report from Brita that Opdam is beaten. I pray God it be not so, for he is very capable of having it happen to him. It is difficult not to enjoy this, because if we sat within the shadow of Marlborough's tent, we could not hear him more distinctly. And the desire we feel to get nearer to the people who interest us, to know them as they really were, is in the main natural and wholesome. Yet there must be some limit set to the gratification of this desire, if we are to check the unwarranted publishing of private letters which has become the recognized disgrace of literature. 
it is hard for us to understand just when our curiosity ceases to be permissible it is harder still for editors to understand just when their privileges cease to be beneficial not many years ago it was possible for mr badgett to say that he took comfort in thinking of shelley as a poet about whom our information was mercifully incomplete thanks to professor dowden it is incomplete no longer but we have scant cause to congratulate ourselves on what we have gained by his disclosures mr frode acting up to an heroic theory of friendship has pilloried carlyle for the pleasure and the pain of gaping generations but there are some who turn away with averted eyes from the sordid shameful spectacle within the last decade the reading world welcomed with acclamations a volume of letters from the pen of one who had made it his especial request that no such correspondence should ever be published how many of those who laughed over the witty whimsical intimate affectionate outpourings of thackeray paused to consider that they would one and all have remained unwritten could their author have foreseen their fate they were not meant for us they would never have reached us had his known desires and prejudices been respected many of them are delightful and when he tells with sedate humour of his absurd proposal to macaulay that they should change identities at sir george napier's dinner so as to confuse and baffle a young american woman the desire of whose heart was to meet these two great lions and of macaulay's disgust at the bare notion of jesting with anything so serious as his literary reputation yet when the recipient of these letters yielded to the temptation of publishing them she would have done well to suppress those trivial colourless and private communications which can have no possible value or interest to others an invitation to dinner is of some importance the day that it arrives but loses its vitality when reprinted forty years after the dinner is eaten there is horror in the thought that a man of genius can never promise himself that grateful privacy which is the lot of his happier and less distinguished brothers but that after he has died in the least ostentatious manner he knows how the whole wide world is made acquainted with his diversions and his digestion with his feeblest jokes and his most tender confidences the problem of what to give and what to withhold must be solved by editors who having laboriously collected their material feel a natural disposition to use it when as occasionally happens the editor regards the author simply as his prey he never conceives the desirability of withholding anything he is as unreserved as a savage and probably defends himself as did montaigne when reproached for the impropriety of his essays by saying that if people do not like details of that description they certainly take great pains to read them among the letters too charming to be lost yet too personal and frankly confiding to be read without some twinges of conscience are those of edward fitzgerald the last man in all england to have coveted such posthumous publicity they reveal truthfully that kind shy proud indolent indifferent and intensely conservative nature a scholar without the prick of ambition a critic with no desire to be judicial an unwearied mind turned aside from healthy and normal currents of activity yet the indiscreet publishing of a private opinion a harmless bit of criticism such as any man has a right to express to a friend drew down upon this least aggressive of authors abuse too coarse to be quoted it is easy to say that browning dishonoured himself rather than fitzgerald by the brutality of his language this is true but nevertheless it is not pleasant to go down to posterity branded with billingsgate by a great poet and it is doubly hard to bear such a weight of vituperation because a word said in a letter has been ruthlessly given to the world the unhesitating fashion in which women reveal themselves to correspondents makes it seem treachery to read their printed pages those girlish confidences of jane austen to cassandra so frank and gay so full of jokes and laughter and country gossip and sisterly affection what a contrast they afford to the attitude of unbroken reserve which miss austen always presented to the world 
yet now the world is free to follow each foolish little jest and to pass judgment on the wit it holds those affectionate and not over-wise outpourings of miss mitford with their effusive terms of endearment those dignified and solemn reflections of sarah coleridge humanized occasionally by a chance remark about the baby or an inadvertent admission that she has gone down twice to supper at an evening party those keen combative brilliant letters of mrs carlyle that are so bitter-sweet those unreserved and purely personal communications of geraldine jewsbury which have no message whatever for the public how much has been given us to which we show scant claim it is true that in the days when the polite letter-writer ruled the land and his baleful influence was felt on every side a great many women wrote elaborate missives which nobody now wants to read but which were then more highly prized than the gossiping pages we have learned to love so well these sedate blue stockings told neither their own affairs nor their neighbors but confined themselves to dignified generalities expressed with johnsonian elegance there was miss seward for example who at times was too ridiculous for even scott's genial forbearance yet whose letters won her such a reputation that we find them diligently sought for years after they were penned fancy admiring groups of men and women listening to miss seward's celebrated epistles to miss rogers and miss weston one of which begins soothing and welcome to me dear sophia is the regret you express for our separation pleasant were the weeks we have recently passed together in this ancient and embowered mansion i had strongly felt the silence and vacancy of the depriving day on which you vanished how prone are our hearts perversely to quarrel with the friendly coercion of employment at the very instant in which it is clearing the torpid and injurious mists of unavailing melancholy the letter which opens in this promising manner closes as might be expected with a fervent and glowing apostrophe to the absent one virtuous friendship how pure how sacred are thy delights sophia thy mind is capable of tasting them in all their poignancy against how many of life's incidents may that capacity be considered as a counterpoise now in the last century when people received letters of this kind they did not as we might suppose laugh and tear them up they treasured them sacredly in their desks and read them to their young nieces and nephews and made fair copies of them for less favored friends yet the same mail-bags which groaned under these ponderous compositions were laden now and then with sir walter's delightful pages all aglow with that diffused spirit of healthy enjoyment that sane and happy knowledge of life that dauntless and incomparable courage perhaps they carried some of coper's letters rich mines of pleasure and profit for us all full to the brim of homely pleasant details which only leisure can find time to note a man who was even ordinarily busy would never have stopped to observe the things which coper tells us about so charmingly the bustling candidate kissing all the maids the hungry beggar who declines to eat vermicelli soup the young thief who is whipped for stealing the butcher's ironwork the kitchen table which is scrubbed into paralysis the retinue of kittens in the barn the foolish old cat who must needs pursue a viper crawling in the sun and the favorite tabby who ungratefully ran away into a ditch and cost the family four shillings before she was recovered coper had time to see all these things had time to hear the soft click of mrs unwood's knitting needles and the hum of the boiling tea-kettle and he had moreover the faculty of bringing all that he saw and heard very vividly before our eyes of interesting us almost against our will in the petty annals of an uneventful life it is no more possible for important city men heads of banking-houses and hard-working members of parliament to write letters of this kind than it is possible for them to hold the attention of generations as gray so easily holds it with a few playful lines of condolence on the death of a friend's cat a few polished verses set like jewels in the delicate filigree of a sportive and caressing letter 
it would be a sensible satisfaction to me he writes to walpole before i testify my sorrow and the sincere part i take in your misfortune to know for certain who it is i lament i knew zara and selima selima was it or fatima or rather i knew them both together for i cannot justly say which was which then as to your handsome cat the name you distinguish her by i am no less at a loss as well knowing one's handsome cat is always the cat one loves best or if one be alive and one dead it is usually the latter which is the handsomer besides if the point were never so clear i hope you do not think me so ill-bred or so imprudent as to forfeit all my interest in the survivor oh no i would rather seem to mistake and imagine to be sure it must be the tabby one that has met with this sad accident labor accomplishes many things in this busy tired world and receives her full share of applause for every nail she drives but leisure writes the letters leisure aided by observation and sometimes as in the case of madame de sauvigny by that rare faculty of receiving and imparting impressions without judicial reasoning by that winning uncontentious amenity which accepts life as it is and men as they chance to be there is no rancor in the light laugh with which this charming frenchwoman greets the follies and frivolities of her day there is no moral protest in her amused survey of that attractive invalid madame de brizac who lies in bed so curled and beautiful that she turns everybody's head i wish you could have seen writes madame de sevigny to her daughter the use she made of her sufferings of her eyes of her sighs of her arms of her hands languishing on the counterpane of the situation and the compassion she excited i was overcome with tenderness and admiration as i gazed on the performance which seemed to me so fine my riveted attention must surely have given satisfaction and bear in mind that it was for the abbe bayard for saint hirene for manjou and plancy that the scene was rehearsed when i remember with what simplicity you are ill you seem to me a mere bungler in comparison this is good-natured ridicule keen but not condemnatory without mercy yet without upbraiding saint beuve who dearly loves madame de sauvigny complains with reason that she is not even angry at things which ought to anger her and that this gentle tolerance lacks humanity when cruelty and wrong-doing call for denunciation yet who can remember so long and tenderly a friend fallen and disgraced who can extend a helping hand so frankly to a fellow-mortal who can love so devotedly or sacrifice herself with such cheerful serenity at the shrine of her deep affections her memory comes down to us through two centuries enriched with graceful fancies we know her as one good and gay gentle and witty and wise who by virtue of her supreme and narrowed genius wrote letters unsurpassed in literature keep my correspondence said lady mary wortley montague in the heyday of her youth and pride it will be as good as madame de sevigny's forty years hence but four times forty years have only served to widen the gulf between these two writers and to place them in parted spheres their work springs from different sources and is as unlike in inspiration as in form it is impossible says saint beuve to speak of women without first putting oneself in a good humour by the thought of madame de sevigny with us moderns this process takes the place of one of those invocations or libations which the ancients were used to offer up to the pure source of grace in the same devout spirit i am glad to close my volume with a few words about this incomparable letter-writer with a little libation poured at her shadowy feet that my last page may leave me and heaven permitting my readers in a good humour cheered by the pleasant memories which gild a passing hour end of section eight end of essays in idleness by agnes replier